Uh, I always wanted to serve on a jury. I'm really super excited to be here, so I really appreciate you having me. I'm looking forward to it. Creating this whole trial, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give a big shout out to the 13th Jury Podcast and Brandy. Yeah, and I applaud you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. That every time you run into Phil Barber, you should reach for yes. <laughs> And then I just looked to the jury, and it's sort of like, look. I was in the eye of the storm, and you guys were watching the storm. Hey, if you're bored <laughs> to work, come pop in and say, hey, we'll have some coffee. You are a ray of sunshine, and I love what you've done with your YouTube channel. Good morning! Happy Friday Eve! Happy Friday Eve! Happy Friday Eve! Good morning! It's gonna be a beautiful day. Um, oh, yes, I do have a sponsor. Oh, that reminds me. I've got to email her back. Ah, ah. Y'all, I am just so behind on everything in my life. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I have to email her back. Um, my bad. Oh. Um, we have so much going on. Oh. Oh. I have, hmm. Oh. I have exciting stuff in my email. Oh. Look at me. Look at me go. Um, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am so glad to see y'all. It is Friday Eve. Um, it's going to be a good day. We have stuff going on. We have stuff going on. Who is it? My new sponsor? Um, I will, I will tell you that. Um, even though I have not emailed her back to get, um, even though I have not emailed her back like I was supposed to. Uh, so technically, I um, haven't sent her the contract yet. But, um, well, I sent her the contract, but just not the video. Anyway, um, so uh, it's a, um, like, internet security type company. Remember when I had some kind of scary stuff happening where I had somebody that had driven to Florida and was, like, trying to find me? And I had to do, um, I did some stuff to, um, to protect myself online and like remove some of my personal information from websites and stuff, um, because it really freaked me out. So, um, this company does that. So, uh, and I paid a lot more than what they charge. And when I found them, then, um, now, you know, so yes, Aura, Aura, yes. Uh, they they charge about half of what I paid. Um, I I wish I had found them before I did it, but I was I was scared, um, and I wanted to do it quickly. Uh, Amanda Davis, happy ten whole months and twubble, happy eight whole months, happy anniversary to y'all, happy happy anniversary to y'all i am happy to see you today good morning um i'm in a good mood youtube better not be youtube and mess it all up for me i'm in a good mood today good mood today um i will tell you we have so much going on so today um god my shoulders you remember how i told you a while back i just now took my medicine so give me 20 minutes and we'll get on track um oh ricky watson had an 11 month <gasps> ricky watson had an 11 month ricky watson that's the newest let me see if i can find it ricky watson that's that's the first 11 month isn't that the first 11 month i'm pretty sure that's the first 11 month um and queen olive ruth ann had 11 months. Oh, y'all, y'all are, Ricky Watson and Queen Oliver, y'all are my first 11 months. That means we're only one month away from our first one year 
membership anniversary. That's nuts. That's so crazy. Oh my gosh, what a year it's been. What a year it has been. <sighs> I'm here for it. I am here for it. Congratulations to y'all. That's awesome. That's so cool. That makes me really happy. I have no idea what I was saying before that because I got super distracted. And like I said, I just now took my medicine. So, no clue. No idea what I was talking about. No idea. Um, I, oh gosh. Every time I move my arm. Um, my shoulders are really messed up for some reason. It's like my mobility is really messed up. And I don't know if it's how I sleep or what. Oh, yeah. Is that what I was talking about? I guess every time I move my shoulder, it's going to remind me, right? Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, Aura is my new sponsor. I just have to send them the video because I forgot because uh, I need a personal assistant to keep me on track. Lucy, get it together. You're supposed to be helping me. She's a terrible personal assistant. Ow. Um. It's getting worse. I every time I move my arm, it's like, um, it's like I can't even hardly move it now. And then I have like this pain that shoots through me. Uh, so if y'all see me <laughs> just fall out, just I'll, I'll be back. Um, all right. So a few things going on. Um, I have been working on. First of all, let's talk a little Karen Reed. Let's talk a little Karen Reed. Um, I'm not going to ow, spoil what I, maybe if I, like, okay, hold on, pause. Don't let me forget, ow, forget what I was talking about. If I, like, pop it, or will that, like, break my arm out of socket or something? I don't know the terms. Um, it could be a torn rotator cuff. I don't have time for a torn rotator cuff. Mine does not hurt into my elbow. It's just right here. <sighs> just getting old. Um, it's both of them, really, but it's mostly this one today. But sometimes it's mostly this one. Anyway, um, I think it might be how I sleep because I sleep like holding my pillow like this. And now I can't even. <sighs> old people probs. Um, so back to Karen Reed. Um, look at me. I remembered where I was going with that, uh, before I got distracted. Um, I, uh, I could have slept wrong, but I think it's because of how I sleep in general, because this has been going on for weeks now. So I think I'm just, y'all just going to have to take me out to pasture. Um, okay. So let's talk Karen Reed for a minute before we get going. Uh, I'm working on episode seven because I wanted to have it done before Sunday because Sunday's Easter. Um, and I have a friend who's having a big surgery tomorrow, so I'm going to be helping her this weekend. So I've been trying to work on it this week while I can. Um, and so I've been working on it and I've been putting in a lot of work when we finish here. I sit here until one o'clock in the morning working on it the last few days. Um, so... Y'all know me, y'all know me in my timelines. Uh, I was putting some stuff together for this and there are some things that I've found that are going to come out on the next episode that are a little bit crazy. So when y'all listen to the next episode, let me know what you think. Um, and there's gonna be some people that are pissed off at me for doing this, but my job is to, is to show the, the, show what I find and find the truth. That is my only job. Um, so it's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be an interesting one. Uh, but the same people that are going to be pissed off at me for pointing this out are also going to be really happy with me about pointing something else out at the beginning of the episode. But isn't that how this case works? It's like one thing that you find is like when you first, especially when you first start looking into this, it's like 
things go in one direction and then it's like oh wait no and then another direction and it's just it's such a it's such a crazy case such a crazy case i think that's why there's so much interest in it um it's uh it's it's a wild one um so that is episode seven i'm going to try to have it um done by maybe tomorrow maybe saturday but i definitely want to have it done before sunday because sunday's easter and i would actually like to have a day off like a whole real one a whole real day off uh so um also speaking of the podcast um thank you dino uh i <laughs> dino do i'll never be able to say dino do I, I it's dino do forever for me um dino bro uh so uh, speaking of the podcast i am doing a contest we announced it yesterday um tomorrow at the end of the stream we will do the drawing for the winner um but uh trying to um trying to get get the listens up for it um which i can't complain they've i've, I've actually been surprised how I, i'm i'm surprised and excited how well it's doing it makes me very happy uh but also it makes me want to share it with everybody else too so uh doing a podcast contest if you go on your phone or wherever you listen to your podcast just screenshot where you're listening to um 13 juror podcast and you can email it to me um and you'll be or tag me on um tag me on twitter uh in a post with it and um you'll be entered to win and also if you do a review for it on apple reviews then uh, send me that and you will be entered twice. So I uh, wanted to get a little contest to um, have fun and uh, reward. Gosh, Streamlabs is deleting stuff again. Y'all, when you, like when you're, I've noticed this the last, mostly like the last week, um, there's a lot of stuff that's being deleted and it's not me. It's not the mods. There are, it's, it's happening. And I, it just happened to T Jennings. I don't know why it was happening to somebody else yesterday. It's happened to Dynado. It's happened to, um, the advocate. It's not us. I mean, unless you're being an asshole, if you're being, if, if that's the case, then yeah, it was probably us. But if you're not, and you're just being your sweet, normal selves, then it's not us. Um, but regardless. Uh, so sorry about that. It's YouTube be YouTubing. Um, all right. Now that we've made it through that stuff, let's talk about what we are going to watch today. So Kathy from Gossip Rumor and Innuendo is, oh, it's like I can't even move this now. Maybe if I just sit this here and stop moving. Um, if uh, you don't follow Gossip Rumor and Innuendo on YouTube, you need to. She's so funny. Um, she is, her channel is, I mean, it is all about the, the, you know, the gossip and the rumors and the innuendos and all of the, all the tea on these trials. Uh, she laughs and says that, um, you know, we, we will watch a lot of the same trials because she, she normally watches in here with us um, for most stuff that we're covering. And so she said uh, that, um, you know, people come to her for uh, the dirt and then she'll send them to me for like facts and all the boring stuff. So <laughs> uh, it is, um, it's, it's a riot. She's, she's really funny. So the trial that she's, uh, one of the ones that she was t talking about that she's starting to cover is this jack-in-the-box trial now we talked a little bit about it and somebody else like there's a couple of y'all who had sent this to me um and so i pulled up one of the links that you sent me yesterday and we were looking at it this is so crazy oh yes kelly p she's so funny isn't she she's so funny i love her to death um so we looked yesterday this is crazy 
it's like, it's, it's a whole hot mess. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, let's, um, let's just take a look at, and let me just, y'all go on and prep yourselves because It's show is weird. Um, all right, let's see. Um, so testimony is underway. We're going to watch some of the clips of some of the crazy stuff. Alrighty, let's see. Okay, so uh, let me share this. Um, so this is her. All right, so she was on the run for like 20 years. Um, and girlfriend got some issues, okay? She's got some, I mean, you know what? Most people that are on trial for murder, that's a common, anyway, um, She's she ain't all there. So, uh, if you missed yesterday, we'll go over this a little bit. Um, Beverly McCallum is accused of pushing Robert Carabello down the basement stairs. So this is her husband. Um, there was a documentary about this. Um, yeah, there's no, I don't think that they're doing it live. It's only um, the clips, which is what we're gonna watch today. But today they're going to talk to her about potentially testifying. So she might be testifying. Um, yeah, she's a black widow. So she's kind of like potentially like the female version of Thami. Which, if that doesn't terrify you. Uh, so this trial is, um, she's accused of pushing Robert Carabello down the basement stairs of the couple's Michigan home, beating him with a hammer and suffocating him back in 2002. Um, so... It says that his fate was a mystery for decades as his charred remains were discovered in 2002 in a metal box in a blueberry patch in western Michigan. Uh, the body was not positively identified as belonging to Carabello until 2015. She wasn't arrested in 2020, uh, arrested until 2020 when she was apprehended at a hotel on the outskirts of Rome. Uh, You know, me and my small town brain, when we first read that yesterday, I was like, oh, Rome? I, I ran a marathon there, uh, or not a marathon, a uh, cross-country meet. I was thinking Rome, Georgia was my first instinct. Anyway, um, some things you shouldn't share, Brandy. Uh, all right, so they apprehended her at a hotel on the outskirts of Rome, not Georgia, Italy, just to be clear, uh, McCallum had been a hotel guest along with her teenage son. Italian hotels are required to register their guests using an online system that connects connects to a police database, which, like I said yesterday, good idea. Blanche Taylor Moore lived half a mile from me, and my mom was her bailer. Whew. Bless it. Um, yeah, we're, let's, okay, let's pull some of this stuff. All right, so Beverly and McCallum. So there's a thing saying, is she a serial killer? Um, where'd it go? coming from. All right. Um,
married to Deneen's mother, Beverly, and living in Michigan in 2002 when Robert disappeared. Investigators were able to positively identify Robert's remains and determine a cause and manner of death, homicide, as a result of numerous blows to the head you with a hear? hammer. The investigation continued for three years and finally murder charges were filed against Beverly McCollum. She was arrested two years later in Italy and tonight we will take you through the murder, the mystery, the arrest, and then take a closer look at the rest of Beverly McCollum's life. How many other husbands? How many other disappearances and suspicious deaths? As we investigate... So this is from um, the oh, from uh, Court TV Bidding Politics. I'm going to skip through a little bit, but uh, it, it, he talks about her other husbands and stuff. Hold on, let me get to this part. Hold on, let's see. Complicated case, and we've had complicated cases before. Here, I remember the first time, which is also very complicated. Someone who has seemingly traveled around and gotten into lots of relationships, people disappearing. It's, it's strange. It's strange, but. This is like, and this is why it makes me think of, it makes me think of the female version of Thami. They'd be a match made in hell. It seems like there is a lot more to the story there's a lot more to her life and the question is as we watch this trial on court tv is this just the beginning this murder trial people men that she has come into contact with through the years we're going to dig into it tonight and what i really want to find out is is who is this woman who is she inside this courtroom? What has she done? Why does she appear? And it starts with Robert Carabaya, who was her husband, who in 2002 yeah, disappeared. Now the case, obviously, is on Court TV, so you will see and hear all the evidence day in and day out, trying to piece it together. But what we're gonna try to do tonight is understand the journey on how this went from um, Jack in the Box to this murder trial, and then what could potentially happen afterwards with everything else that we're learning about this defendant, about this woman. He's so nice. So let's start with that trunk. Um, Detective Robert Donker testifying today. Okay, we're going to skip. Have fallen down and dangled. We're going to watch the testimony part, so I want to get to the other stuff because we're we're gonna watch that fair to say yes you're also seeing a rope around the victim again i i'd invest or all locating had occurred there and that at that point we're gonna watch this the small roller's been placed next I'm to all, to all we were able to tell at that point with the extensive our our biggest hope of being able to confirm no. Because you were holding on to this case so long, did there come a point in time that your department actually named this case? It's obvious there's foul play. You've got potential murder weapon, a hammer there. You've, you've got the body burnt, the evidence destroyed, covering it up. Oh, this is a watch. documentary. What I thought I saw. And Oh, here it is. We're going to watch the guy testify against her, too. And then there was a documentary. All right, so here's the documentary. A professor and some students took a look at this case and put together a documentary. Take a look. It's, it's called Jack in the Box. I was almost in denial, you might say, I thought. I really didn't see what I thought I saw. And I had to just collect my thoughts a little, and, and I just drove around the farm. And... It was there, I knew it was there, and I knew it was going to be there. It was bad, it was, it was burned beyond recognition. I got out of the vehicle, and just to make sure that I didn't make a real complete fool of myself, yeah, I'd forgotten my cell phone, so I went to see a neighbor that I saw working out in the field and uh, used his cell phone, and also took him back here. So I called 911. 
911? Yes, I'd like to report a body. What do you mean a body? A dead person. Okay, where at? Okay, Grand Haven Township. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see, 152nd and Winnin. Okay. About 100 yards to the east of 152nd on Winnin. East of 152nd on Winnin? Yep, and I'll be there with a pickup. Sitting, waiting for someone to... Was it in the... Now keep in mind... The way that this is burnt and everything was years later um, that they were able to identify him. Um, but, like, they had, um, uh, what they say, that that one officer uh, worked for it for 13 years to identify him because of how, like, burnt and everything. It there. It's in, it's, in my, uh, it's in my field, and it's burned. And it wasn't the year yesterday. Can you tell if it's a male or female or? It's pretty badly burned. 13 years that they worked. So. And joining me now in Grand Haven, Michigan, former communications professor. All right, let me get to this. If we can identify this victim, we can solve this crime. And so the goal was to. Yeah, identify who this might have been. Now, the theories were, were wide, that it was uh, a migrant worker, that there had been some kind of uh, disagreement. Let me get forward a little. They go over some of the evidence, and some of this we're going to hear, so I'm not going to, because we're going to watch the clips. It was all new to me. Surprised? Uh, uh, n no, uh, because I had nothing right. to gauge it against. My goal had been that someplace out there, somebody knew what had happened to this victim, Jack in the Box. We did not know his name. We had no idea. But we knew that somebody knew. Somebody always knows. Absolutely. We talk about that every day here on Court TV in the true crime community that is so vibrant right now um, around the nation and around the world. All right, David Schock is going plus. Department of Homeland Security agents. Um. Matching set of two trunks. Um. A bag was placed over his head. How far? I don't want to get too much into this trial yet because. I was, and Beverly starts this, to tell Deneen. Is this the one that has the stuff about the other husbands? Hold on. Hits him like three or four more We're times until the hammer was in his head. Beverly was sitting up on top of him to keep him from moving. And he laid like that until the bag quit moving. In. I don't want to watch the, that because we're going to watch those highlights. That's the daughter. In the box. Two. Haven't seen. Maybe this isn't the one. It's Mover. I think Beverly was. And I think, oh, I, I know I from his earlier testimony, I, I, I have not been in court this week. Uh, as a result of uh, some neck surgery. But I was there when he allocuted to his part at, at, as the first defendant and when he gave himself up. I think that he was afraid of Beverly to start with, and then I think this worked on him. And it is my hope and belief that he grew a conscience a lot of things happen over 20 years. I mean, people get religion, other people die, people grow afraid, or they grow less afraid. And I think Chris McMillan realized that what he had done was going to put him in a lifetime and beyond this lifetime of hell. We've got another guest joining us by phone in Lansing, Michigan, the attorney. There's also... Um uh, let's see. Dang, I've had. I wish I'd have saved it in my stuff yesterday. There was 
one that went over um I guess I didn't save it. It's not in my history stuff either. Um, but there was one that went over some of like the previous um, oh, previous stuff. I thought it was on this one. All right. So the she took her daughter's like. So what? I am so so yeah. excited to have you. Guys. Um, one of her daughters what uh, like did this with her which is um sad and scary uh but the other one um one of the ones that i mean she was nine at the time um um like she started asking questions and her mom beverly was like um like she started asking questions about you know um, the dad and, and she was like, oh yeah, he went to, um, he kind of like, you know, it's it like peace out and went to his family. And then years later she reached out to them and they were like, uh, no. So that's how they found out that she was missing or that he was missing and, um, and crazy, crazy. Uh, so she ended up going to police. So the two that were involved though, the daughter and, um, the, uh, um, and the daughter's friend, um, one of them, the daughter is serving a life sentence on first degree murder conviction. And the one who testifies against her here that we're going to watch, um, is serving a 15 to 40 year sentence. Um, uh, he did a plea agreement. So, and they said on the updates from yesterday that they are, um, talking to her about potentially testifying. So she may testify today. Craziness. So we're going to watch some of the highlights from this. And then at the end of today, we'll look at some of the highlights from the other trial that we were watching. Um, so day one was the 25th. So prosecutor gave the state's opening and tells the jury that Robert Caraballo was murdered by three people. His, I said three, and I held up two, three, three people. Um, and the one is the defendant, and then the two co-conspirators. Uh, so we're going to watch the opening statements first. Let me get it pulled up. Right now they're going over text messages in the other trial. So we're going to do highlights. All right. the all right here's opening statements <clears throat> morning, oh i hate when they only have audio in one ear on may 7 2002 robert carabello also known as juan centron was coming back to his home at 334 horatio street here in the city of charlotte eaton county michigan as he did on most days on that day, though, people had already put a plan into place to kill him. And when he arrived home, they put that plan in action. Robert came in his home at 334 Horatio and began to go to his basement. As he started down the stairs, he was pushed. At the bottom of the stairs, people waited for him with a bat and a hammer. A bat was swung. A hammer hit him so hard that it stuck in his head. To finish him off, a bag was placed over his head and a rope around his neck. Robert died in the basement that day.
but that wasn't the end. Those same people then placed him in a trunk, carried him up the basement and put him in a van, drove him away to a two-track road, took him up that road and lit him on fire. One of the individuals who helped plan Robert's death, who actually helped kill Robert, who helped take him away, and who lit him on fire, is the defendant who sits here today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the defendant is charged with two counts, a count of murder and a count of burning dead bodies. The information that brings us to this courtroom to stay, today states, in the state of Michigan, County of Eaton, in the name of the people of the state of Michigan, the prosecuting attorney for this county before, appears before the court and informs the court that on or about April 2002 to June 2002, here at uh, 334 Horatio and in Eaton County, the defendant, count one, did with intent to kill, to do great bodily harm, or to act in a wanton and willful disregard of the likelihood that the natural tendency of such act would cause death or great bodily harm, kill and murder one Robert Carabello. Said act committed without premeditation or deliberation, contrary to state law. Count two, did mutilate, deface, remove, or carry away a portion of a dead body, contrary to state law. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you listen to the facts of this case. How sad is it, though, that if it had not been for that um, documentary, they may not have, like, they may not have been able to know. Over the next week, you may want to just shake your head and say, how can this be true? But ladies and gentlemen, the people are going to be bringing in witnesses from across the state, as well as across the country. And at the end of the case, when you've heard all the testimony, it's going to make sense to you. Now, if you remember on Friday, Judge Cunningham told you that she's going to give you notepads and pens. I see a lot of you have them sitting in your hands. And while I think that's great, I'm going to caution you. Because what I don't want to see you have, have happen, which happens to a lot of us, is we get wrapped up so much in wanting to write down the answer of something that we saw or thought was important that we then miss the next important thing that gets said on the stand. So I'm going to suggest that you just sit back and listen. Now realize that this case took over 17 years. That's a lot of information that you're going to have to hear. You're going to hear from a lot of witnesses who are going to tell you what happened before, on, and after 2002. Some of it will be disjointed only because the people are responsible for proving this case. And obviously, everyone can understand if you've ever traveled, trying to get people in in an orderly fashion doesn't always occur. But one of the witnesses you're going to hear from is Cicely Caraballo. Cicely's going to tell you that in 2002, she lived here in Charlotte. She lived here with her father, Robert Caraballo, who you will find out is the victim in this case. She's also going to tell you that she lived with Beverly McCollum, the defendant in this case. She's also going to tell you that she lived there with her sister, Tasha, and another sister, Deneen. Cicely's going to tell you how she remembers the last day she ever saw her father. And she's also going to tell you that she has memories of being asleep, being woken up and put in a van, and driving for a good period of time. And she's going to tell you she has memories of actually seeing a big ball of flames and her sister Deneen running to the van. And she's going to tell you that after that, she never sees her father again. And she's going to tell you that what the defendant tells her is that her father left her and that he actually moved up to Canada to continue selling drugs. Now, Cicely's going to tell you that she had to live with that. And she's going to tell you that during the years after that, 
There were times where family members would make innuendos of you know what happened, you know what happened to your dad. But she's going to tell you that it's not actually until 2015, 2016 that she actually figures out by talking to her dad's family that her dad's family hadn't seen him since 2002 either. And she's going to tell you that it actually got to the point where she confronted the defendant. And she's going to tell you how that went down and how at the end of that, the defendant admitted she had been part of killing Robert. Cicely's also going to tell you too that she had the opportunity to meet with the detectives, the same detectives who will testify here for you this week. She's going to tell you that it was at that point when she met to those detectives that she actually learned for sure that her father was dead. And she's going to tell you that during that conversation and after that initial conversation, well, that during that conversation, and it's a lengthy one, she actually tells the detectives that there was an individual named Chris there. And she'll tell you that she remembers this Chris actually hanging around back in 2002. <clears throat> Cicely's going to tell you that she actually helped find a picture of this Chris person from 2002. And she's going to tell you that in reality, after learning that her father was died, she didn't even get to see his gravesite until she was able to go to Ottawa County in 2021 and visit his grave. Now, you're also going to hear from a Brenda, and I apologize now, all of a sudden I've lost it, a Diane Brenton. Diane Brenton's going to tell you that in 2002, she also lived at 334 Horatio. And what she's going to explain is that 334 Horatio is a house, but in reality, it's a duplex. She's going to tell you that she lived on the second floor of that duplex. And she's going to advise you that on the first floor lived Robert Colabaro and the defendant, as well as their children. And she actually got to know them a little bit, at least enough to say hi. And she's going to advise you that Robert was there and then all of a sudden he wasn't. She's going to tell you that the things that she remembers is that when Robert all of a sudden wasn't there, the defendant told her that Robert had left them and so she was selling everything and moving away. And she did. You're going to hear from a Gordon DeVries. Now in 2002, Gordon DeVries owned a 60 acre blueberry field in Ottawa County. And Gordon's going to tell you that he went to his property most days. He's going to tell you on May 7, 2002, he went to his property, which is on a dirt road. Dirt road heads into a two track that goes along a wooded area into the blueberry field. And he's going to tell you on May 7, 2002, everything was fine. Drove up the two track, looked at his field, nothing was wrong. Gordon's going to tell you that he comes back on May 8, 2002. Does the same thing that he does every day. He goes into the two track, begins to drive up the court two track, but yet this time things are different. Gordon's going to explain to you that he saw scorched earth. And Gordon's going to tell you that as he drove along that two track, he saw in the middle of that scorched earth a trunk. And inside that trunk and hanging out of that trunk was a burned up, what he believed to be person. Now Gordon's going to tell you that, wow, he didn't really want that to be true. And so Gordon drove around his blueberry field and came back. And Gordon's going to tell you that when he came back, he saw the exact same thing. So he drove out, went to a neighbor's farm, got the neighbor to make sure that he wasn't just seeing things, and when they both observed it, they called police. 
One of the witnesses that you will hear from this week is a Dr. Cole. Dr. Cole was and is the medical examiner for Ottawa County. Dr. Cole is going to tell you that he came to Gordon's property on May 8th, 2002. Dr. Cole is going to tell you that he observed this body hanging in and out of the trunk. Dr. Cole is going to tell you that this body was severely burned. But Dr. Cole is going to tell you that as he makes his initial observations, he sees dental work in the victim's mouth. Dental work that is so unique to him, yeah. he believes that the police should be able to figure out who the victim was. Her daughter and her daughter's quickly. friend. Dr. Cole is going to advise you that in and around the trunk are found a hammer and a bat. And Dr. Cole is going to tell you that that trunk and the victim are picked up and carried away back to be autopsy. Dr. Cole is going to tell you that he autopsies this victim and the victim has several strikes in his head. This victim died of blunt force trauma. And Dr. Cole is going to point out other things. He's going to point out that there was a remnants of a grocery bag around the victim's head and there was a rope around his neck. You're also going to hear from Detective Robert Donker. Detective Donker is a retired Ottawa County Sheriff's Department detective. And in 2002, he was a detective for that department. And he's going to advise you that on May 8th, 2002, he gets called out to 152nd and Winding Street in Ottawa County, Gordon's property. Detective Donker is going to advise you that he got called out there for a dead body. Detective Donker was made the lead detective. And Detective Donker is going to tell you what he saw on May 8th, 2002. Detective Donker is going to walk you through the crime scene video that was actually produced. He is going to show you the pictures that he instructed his officers to take during that time. And you're going to see what he saw on Gordon's property on that day. Detective Docker is going to tell you that while no arson expert, he had done plenty of arsons. And from the looks of that body, that body had not died a natural death. Detective Docker is going to tell you that he takes the information that is initially given to him by his officers and he begins to investigate. And Detective Donker is going to advise you all the things his officers did in order to try to figure out who the victim was or who a suspect may be. Detective Donker is going to tell you that as this case moves along, his department even goes to the extremes of trying to bring in a dentist, a dentist who actually does an article about the victim's teeth. An article that is put out in the hopes that a dentist or someone might actually know who that victim was. <laughs> Detective Donker is going to tell you that in 2005, his department actually agreed to allow a professor from Hope College to come in and do a documentary. They allowed him to see the crime scene video and the pictures in order to try to see if they could figure out who that victim was. That documentary was called Jack in the Box. But for everything D Detective Donker did, there came a point that there was just no more investigation to be had. It becomes what you've heard of as a cold case. 
Not really in the sense that Detective Donker just threw it on the shelf. It was just something that, while it sat on his desk, there wasn't anything he could do. All of that changed in April of 2015. In April of 2015, Detective Donker gets an email. That email is from Deneen Descharmes the sister of Sisterly, the daughter of the defendant. That email is entitled, Jack in the Box. Detective Donker is going to tell you that through emails and phone calls, he's able to discover things that allow him to begin investigating again. Detective Donker is going to advise you that he learns that Deneen Descharmes had watched a portion of that Jack in the Box video. He's going to advise you that she says she believes her mother, the defendant, killed Robert. She believes that that person in the trunk is Robert and proceeds to give two names. Robert Carabello and Juan Cintron, as well as a birthday. Now see, Robert was known as Juan Cintron in the 90s to 2001 when he was in federal prison. And so, Detective Donker will also advise you that he's informed at that time that in 2002, the defendant owned a trunk similar to the one that Robert was laying in. So now Detective Donker has some information and he's going to explain to you how he's able to investigate with the information he receives. He's going to tell you that he actually went to the federal probation systems, went to the federal prison systems, and he was actually able to determine that there were two Juan Cintrons located in prison in the 1990s. He's going to tell you that one of those prisoners had been paroled to Charlotte, Michigan. And he's actually going to tell you that when he was paroled, he first went to a Harris Street address and his last known address was 334 Horatio. Hold on, see if you can hear the cannon. I don't have my window open, but you can still hear it through. Do you hear it? Detective Donker is going to tell you that because he now has that information, he's able to actually obtain this Juan Cintron's uh, dental records. And he's going to advise you that he does. And Detective Donker is going to advise you that he then speaks to Dr. Cole and some of Dr. Cole's colleagues and through them a being able to take this victim's dental work that they still had from 2002 as well as the dental records of Juan Centron, they were able to make an identification. That identification was Juan Centron or who I will call Robert Carabello. Now you'll hear the two names and his daughter Cicely will explain to you why Robert had two names. So Detective Donker now has a victim. He knows that this burned up dead body in Gordon's field was Robert Carabello. And he also knows that his last known address was here in Charlotte. So because of that, the Ottawa County Sheriff's Department decided that, hey, you know what, we, we should bring Eaton County into this because we don't know where exactly Robert died. They're going to tell you that they, one of the first things they did was make the determination they were going to go to 334 Horatio. And you're going to hear and actually see pictures of how 334 Horatio looked in 2015. The house had basically been abandoned. It looked like somebody was attempting to demo 
There were no longer drywall on the walls. It was just studs. And having no idea at that moment where Robert may have died, they called in the Michigan State Police Crime Lab, who proceeded to actually investigate the first floor area. But you're going to hear that nothing was actually found on that first floor. You're going to hear that the detectives begin to do preliminary preliminary information on this case. They learn about Robert. They learn about the defendant. They actually determined that it was the defendant who owned 334 Horatio in 2002. And they look into all the other witnesses. Now, in reality, the only information they have is from Deneen Descharm at this point. And so they realize we're going to have to actually go interview people. So they went to Texas. See, in Texas, Deneen Descharm was living. The defendant was living. Cicely was living. And her sister Tasha was living there as well. So Detective Donker and Detective Maltby head to Texas and they begin talking to people, learning information, learning family backgrounds, and then they talk to Denise. And they're going to tell you that during those conversations they had with Denise, we'll there were bit. several things that actually allowed them to go, okay, we got to go back up to Michigan and investigate. You're going to hear that one of the first things that drew their attention since they had already gone to 334 Horatio was that Deneen Descharmes said that the defendant killed Robert in the basement. Now see, the detectives are going to tell you that that first floor had the first floor and the access to the basement. But they hadn't gone to the basement. They didn't know what they were looking for, so that wasn't something they had done. You're going to hear from them that another important point that Deneen says that they're going to have to investigate is that her mother or her chipped up the basement, chipped up the concrete in the basement after Robert had been killed to try to clean up all the blood. You're going to hear that there was a trunk that the defendant had at the end of her bed that wasn't there after 2002 and that there was a matching trunk that was green that she also had. So they're going to advise you that of the things that they learned, things that they felt were important, things that they needed to take to go investigate. So you're going to hear that they go back up to Michigan and you're going to hear that they make the determination they're going to go back to 334 Horatio. And they're going to tell you that they observe certain things when they go into the basement. The basement has wooden posts around it. And you'll see the pictures of them. There are brownish posts, but on certain areas of the post was painted white. They didn't know why at that particular moment. And they're going to tell you too that in the corner of the basement, there was concrete. They're actually going to tell you that what they had learned that this was kind of Robert's spot. In 2002, he'd go down to the basement and read his Bible and write letters to his family. And that concrete area was there. But they couldn't find any chipped up concrete. But what they did see was this patch of concrete. And this patch of concrete looked newer than the other concrete that was there. The detectives are going to tell you that they bring in the Michigan State Police Crime Lab again. The Michigan State Police Crime Lab will be here to testify, and they're going to tell you that they went down to the basement, and they'll explain to you all of the tests that they did. What the end result will be, ladies and gentlemen, that they found remnants of DNA underneath those white, pa white painted areas, and that patch of concrete, well, they chipped it up and turned it over, and when they tested it, they found DNA as well. And you'll hear from another individual who actually tested that DNA and you're going to hear that when that DNA is tested, it's Robert Carabello. So now the detectives believe that they know where the crime happened. 
They definitely know where they found Robert, and that's on Gordon's Blueberry Farm. But after learning all of that information, they make the determination they're probably going to need to go back and talk to people in Texas again. And you're going to hear that they did. Now, one thing I'll point out is one of the other things that Deneen said in those initial interviews is that there was a guy, Chris, that hung around at that time. And while she doesn't really remember much, if you find that guy, Chris, he's going to let you know what happened. So when they go back in 2016, they sit down with Cicely. Cicely's going to tell you what happened. And as they're discussing things with her, they're going to advise you that Cicely just mentions on her own, hey, there was a guy, Chris, that hung out in 2002. Now, you're going to hear from the detectives that that was really interesting. Because at this point, that was only the second time they had heard Chris's name. And you're going to hear that through these conversations and after that, Cicely tried to find a picture of Chris. Because you're going to hear from the detectives that Deneen Desharm has provided the name of Chris Mick, Chris McMillan, Chris Mick something. And they were out searching the Char Charlotte area looking for a person with those kind of names. Cicely actually provides a photo to the detectives of Chris McMillan in 2002 with her sister Tasha. And the detectives are going to tell you that because of that, they're actually able to further investigate. Now understand, when I started talking to you, I started talking to you about something that happened before, that happened in 2002. I'm now till 2018. In 2018, the detectives are actually able, through searches, funny enough, through Facebook, they're actually able to look at pictures and figure out that they believe they have the person who was in that picture and his name is Chris McMillan. And the detectives are going to tell you that when they did their search of Chris McMillan, they found out that he was living in Grand Rapids. And in 2018, they went and knocked on his door and confronted him. Chris McMillan is going to testify as well. Chris McMillan is going to tell you what he told the detectives over three interviews. Chris McMillan is going to tell you that in 2001, he moved up from Texas to the Charlotte area to live with his brother. He's going to tell you that after he got up here in around February or March 2002, he met Deneen Deshaun. He's going to tell you that he became friends with Deneen. He became friends to the point that she invited him to come over to her mother and father's house at 334 Horatio. Chris is going to tell you that he met Robert Carabello. He met the defendant. He knew Cicely. He knew Tasha. And Chris began hanging out at the house. Chris is going to tell you that he hung out at that house a lot. Chris is going to tell you that about a week before Robert's died, and he's going to tell you he doesn't remember the date. He knows the day Robert died, but he doesn't know the date that that occurred. But he knows about a week beforehand, he actually was with Deneen when Deneen advised him that, hey, look, we need to get rid of Robert. Robert is abusing the kids, and he's abusing my mom, and so we need to get rid of him. And he's going to tell you that the defendant came into the room during that conversation. And they talked about a plan where they wanted to push Robert down the stairs, hit him in the head with a bat, and put a bag over his head and suffocate him. Chris is going to tell you that it wasn't a very lengthy conversation, but that's what was said. And then they moved on talking about something else. Chris is going to tell you about three days before Robert is killed. He's in the basement with Deneen. And he's going to tell you that in the basement, was always this little league wooden bat, a bat he had touched many times. And he's going to advise you how on that day he is told by Deneen and the defendant where to stand and what was going to occur for them to take out Robert. That when Robert got to the bottom of the stairs, Chris was to hit him in the head with a bat and they would put a bag over his face and suffocate him. That's crazy. Chris will tell you that once again he's still not really believing this is going to actually occur. 
But he's going to tell you about three days after that, he and Deneen are in the basement again. The door was closed to the basement and it opens. Chris is going to advise you that when he looks up around the stairs, he sees Robert and he then sees the defendant push Robert down the stairs. Chris is going to advise you that when Robert got pushed down the stairs, he swung that bat. It missed Robert and hit a post and broke into pieces. Chris is going to tell you that Robert never really got. Chris is the other co-defendant. He's the one who took the plea deal and he got 14 to 40 years. Um, and he's going to be testifying. We're going to watch that. Um, the, yeah, the long hair guy. He, we're going to watch that. He testifies against her. Got back up after he hit the bottom of those stairs. As part of his plea deal. The next thing Chris will tell you that he remembers happening is that Deneen Desharm had a hammer in her hand and that she struck Robert twice with that hammer. She's going to tell you that while that's occurring, the defendant is yelling, give me the hammer, give me the hammer, give me the hammer, and the defendant takes that hammer. And the defendant begins striking Robert in the head. Struck him so hard that it actually left the hammer embedded in his head. Chris is going to tell you that he remembers actually then pulling that hammer out of Robert's head and that there was blood everywhere. Chris is going to tell you that the next thing he knows is that, there, that the, Robert is on his back, the defendant is on his chest, Deneen is at his head, a bag is over his head, and a rope is around his neck. Chris is going to tell you that he watched Robert die. That bag breath just got slower and slower. Rob, Chris is going to tell you that he knows Robert died in the basement that day. And after that, he's going to tell you that they all changed their clothes and just went to the dollar store. And at the dollar store, they proceeded to get ammonia and bleach, things that you would need to clean up a murder scene. Chris is going to advise you that Deneen and the defendant then went back down to that basement in order to attempt to clean up the mess. And he's going to tell you too that by the time the girls got home from school, there was a padlock on that basement door. He'll also tell you too that later that night, he was summoned down to the basement because they were waiting for it to get dark. And he and Deneen, well, when he went to the basement, he noticed a black trunk. That same trunk that used to sit in front of Deneen's bed, uh, excuse me, in front of the defendant's bed. And inside that trunk was Robert. He's gonna tell you that at the defendant's direction, Deneen and he carried Robert out of the basement and put him in Robert's van. He's going to tell you that he and Deneen picked the girls up because they were asleep and put them in the van and that Deneen got in the driver's seat, he got in the passenger seat, and the defendant got in the middle. He's going to tell you that they went to a gas station by the highway where they filled the van up and filled up a gas can that they had grabbed to bring with them. He's going to advise you that they then got on the highway. And Chris is going to tell you I wasn't from here. I have no idea where I went, but I know it was at least 45 minutes. But at some point, he's going to tell you that they pulled off the highway and went on a dirt road and stopped at a two-track. Chris is going to tell you that there was a gate there. So they pulled Robert's body out, put it on something, and then dragged Robert up the two-track and off the side into the woods. Chris is going to advise you then he and Deneen came back to the van and at that point the defendant said, hey wait, I forgot Robert had a gold ring on his finger, I want it. So they went back to Robert and began pulling him out of the trunk. They found that gold ring and Chris is going to tell you that he poured gas all over Robert and the defendant lit the match. And when those big, thing, big flames happened, they ran away. They ran back to that van and Deneen was in the driver's seat. Chris got back in the passenger seat and the defendant got in the middle and they headed back to Charlotte. And Chris is going to tell you that on their way back, the defendant told them to throw their shoes out the window so that there wouldn't be any footprints that might have been left at that scene. And Chris is going to tell you that when they got back, one of the first things they did was actually go and replace the tires on that van. The defendant and Chris went to replace the tires. And he'll tell you he did that in case to make sure there weren't any tire tracks. 
And Chris is going to tell you that after Robert's dead, the defendant directs he and Deneen to go to the basement. See, when they had tried to clean up those posts, the blood had just smeared. So he and Deneen painted the areas of the posts that had the blood on them, that white paint. And he's going to tell you that the concrete area ended and there was dirt and concrete and there had been blood all over it and that was chipped up and he's going to tell you that he actually mixed up the new set of concrete and Deneen Ducharme laid down the patch that same patch that in 2016 2017 the lab actually find Robert's blood underneath Ow. now ladies and gentlemen Chris will appear to you in a jail outfit because see, once Chris actually said those things, he was arrested. Now when he told the detectives, he wasn't. He wasn't under arrest. But after he told those things, along with all the information the detectives knew, he was arrested. And he was charged with open murder, conspiracy to commit open murder, and defacing a body. And Chris is going to admit that he took a plea deal. He pled to murder to, and conspiracy to commit murder to, with a minimum 15 year sentence for him to testify against the co-defendants in this matter. But Chris is also going to tell you too that the information he provided to the, def to the detectives, that was done long before he was ever charged with that crime or given the pre plea deal that he was given. Now ladies and gentlemen, as a prosecuting attorney, I'm responsible for proving to you that a crime has been committed. I'm also responsible for proving to you beyond a reasonable doubt that it's the defendant who committed that crime. When I'm presenting the testimony to you, what I'm attempting to do is present you the facts, the evidence, the testimony that will allow you at the conclusion of this case to look at the jury instructions that Judge Cunningham is going to give you and find the defendant guilty. Because Mr. Tetloff and I are charged with that responsibility, what I'd like to do is go through those instructions that Judge Cunningham is going to read you so that you have an idea as to what to look for when you're listening to the testimony. For homicide, second degree murder, there are three elements, three instructions to that case. One, that the defendant causes a death. Okay, um, I must get the instructions part. We know how this stuff works. We wanna hear. In a way, a portion of a dead body I'm going to have to show you two elements or... All right, let's get to defense. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. My name is John Finley, and I'm one of the attorneys that's going to be representing Ms. Beverly McCollum, along with Mr. Timothy Havis. We didn't get a chance to meet during the voir dire process, but now is my time to address you and inform you of our side and our perspective in this case. First and foremost, I want to take the time to thank you all for being here and giving us your time and your attention. We hope that this trial will take roughly about a week, but ultimately we're prepared to be here longer if necessary. And I apologize for you about that. But it's important that you hear this case from both the prosecution's perspective as well as the defense's perspective as well. Now, before we proceed any further into my statement, I would like to give you a frame of reference of where exactly in time that we are, because this is crucial to the analysis for this case. The alleged incident had occurred on or about May 7th of 2002. This is significant because this is just over two decades ago. We're in 2024 as of right now. Thank you, Ann. Do you all remember around this time where you all were? Do you remember the state of the country that we were in? Even the state of the world? Let me just give you a little bit of insight at that time. George W. Bush was still in his first term as president of the United States, and he was arguably dealing with one of the most tragic instances our country has ever dealt with since Abraham Lincoln, which was September 11th. Tom Brady had won his first Super Bowl as quarterback of the New England Patriots and thus arguably started one of the most notable dynasties in all of sports history. And also around this time too, almost 62% of all adults in the country had cell phones. Not only that, the two prominent cell phone brands at that time were Nokia and Motorola. Now that I have your attention, there are some important rules that I want to highlight that have been touched upon by both Judge Cunningham as well as Prosecutor Lloyd. First, there is the presumption of innocence. Today, as Ms. Beverly sits here, she is an innocent woman. As Mr. Havis highlighted during voir dire, 
the starting point for our position is at zero, and will remain at zero until you feel firmly convinced that the. Okay, wait. Is he reading this from his phone? He's reading this from his phone. Am I see am I seeing this right? He's the prosecutor has moved that gauge. He is. He's reading this from this his phone. This means that we don't have to prove anything. The defense has to do nothing. We could sit back, look up some more random facts about random time periods in history, or we could just sit back and watch March Madness. And none of those things should be taken against Ms. Beverly. This presumption stays with Ms. Beverly throughout the trial, and she's entitled to a verdict of not guilty, unless the prosecution can convince you otherwise. The need for the prosecution to convince you is an obligation on their side known as the burden of proof. In regards to the burden of proof, every crime has specific yeah, parts. This. Those specific parts are called elements. It is the sole burden of the prosecutor to prove every single one of those elements for every single crime, and he has to prove all of those elements of every crime beyond a reasonable doubt. If any element is missed, or you don't believe that the standard has been met, then the presumption of innocence cannot and must not be overcome, which means that that would have to render a verdict of not guilty. The reasonable doubt standard is a fair and honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It is not merely an imaginary or possible doubt but a doubt based on reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable. After a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of this case. Yes, the lack of evidence is also evidence. Going beyond that reasonable doubt standard means that you must be convinced that the prosecution has been able to rule out any other logical, possible alternative and that may arise out of the events in their story. You may believe what Mr. Lloyd has said. And that could be established and plausible. Or even a possible story of what happened in 2002 to Mr. Carabello. But if you feel that there is a doubt that grows from that story in any presentation of that evidence, you would still have to issue a verdict of not guilty. You were chosen by us as the finders of fact. Therefore, using reason and common sense, you must ask yourself if the evidence is fully satisfied each specific element of each specific crime without requiring the need for you to infer or guess. Inferences do not amount to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Plus, after the closing of proofs, if you believe that it is logically possible that any of the alternate series of events exist, then that is doubt and subsequently means a not guilty verdict must be rendered. Now, Mr. Lloyd had already gone over these elements with you, but I think it is important for us to go back over and highlight the charges that Ms. Beverly is facing. For count one, the crime of second degree murder, in order to prove this charge, the prosecution must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant caused the death of Robert Caraballo. That is, that Robert Caraballo died as a result of being bludgeoned and suffocated to death. This means you have to believe that Miss Beverly, not only bludgeoned, she also suffocated Mr. Carabello as well. Second, that the defendant had one of these three states of mind. She intended to kill, she intended to do great bodily harm to Robert Carabello, or she created a, or she knowingly created a very high risk of death or great bodily harm, knowing that death or such harm would be likely a result of her actions. This means that Beverly, or Miss Beverly, had the actual state of mind to kill, intend great bodily harm, or created a very high likelihood of death, or great bodily harm resulting from her actions. Then that killing was not justified, excused, or done under any circumstances that would reduce it to a lesser crime. This means that she didn't do it in self-defense or had an excuse in killing Mr. Caraballo. For count two, the crime of mutilation of a human body. In order to prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. That Beverly Ann McCollum did without legal authorization to do caused 
permanent damage to a portion of a dead body defaced a portion of a dead body by marring its appearance or removed or carried away from the whole a portion of a dead body. This means that her specific actions are what created the damage, defacing, removal, or carrying away of a portion of that dead body. And that Ms. Beverly did not have the authority to do that whatsoever. Now with all that information presented, and soon to be presented to you during the course of this trial, how can you be able to determine if that burden has been met on each and every single one of those elements? Watch for certain red flags concerning the accuracy of these witnesses' statements regarding over 20 years. You have to remember that all these people are testifying are testifying to an event that happened over two decades ago. Remember, this event occurred in 2002. If somebody asked you what you did last week, Tuesday at 423, on or about in the evening time, would you be able to remember? How about a week prior to that? At maybe 830 in the morning. It's very specific instances indeed. Now compare that to something that happened two decades ago. Now this leads me to my first point regarding witnesses. You as the jurors need to determine how much time has gone by since the memory has happened. What was the age or maturity level of the witness at that time of the reported memory? There will be some people up here that, were, that are testifying during the course of the trial that were around 30 years old. This would mean that in fact around that time they were very young, anywhere between 78 years old at least. And that may also attribute to whether or not they can accurately remember the incident, the events accurately. There is also a likelihood that they talked about with other family members afterwards as well. They also could have had a possibility that they read about this incident as well. This case has been highly publicized for years. It could have been some likely that they read or heard something that maybe influenced their memories. You are all tasked with making sure that their testimony about the incident are their actual memories and not ones that they artificially created or indirectly created over the last 20 years. Also looking at if somebody had been heavily using drugs may contribute to their inability to remember what they've seen as well. Did they have any type of injury that would cause them to potentially lose their memory? Did they have a desire or motivation for their answers to change or did they want potentially revenge on somebody? Has the witness mistaken someone else's memory of the event as their own? And you'll need to make sure that that is also their own memory as well. How often has their story changed? Does a witness have a bias or personal interest in the outcome of the case? Does a witness have any special reason to lie or any special reason to be truthful? Does a witness make an honest effort to tell the truth or do they evade the, the, the questions and argue back with the attorneys that ask them those questions? Do they get defensive about being confronted with the inconsistencies? How confident are their answers? And does the witness seem to grasp the difference between reality and imaginary? Consistency absolutely matters. Now, it's necessary to have an extra layer of caution when assessing the accuracy of each witness's memory because we, again, we're talking about an incident that happened over two decades ago. There's a lot of room for error, especially for those who were involved that have been searching for answers to what really happened to Mr. Caravello 20 years ago. How solid is your memory from the spring of 2002? Think back to the beginning of my opening where we discussed the top cell phone brands in the world at that time. George W. Bush being in his first term as President of the United States and Tom Brady winning his first Super Bowl. Now bringing you all back to the present day of 2024. We are all here for one purpose, and that is to listen, hear, and see, and to finally make a decision on what really happened to Mr. Roberto Carvalho. You 14 jurors are the finders of fact here, which means that you are all tasked with deciding what the truth is. You get to decide who's telling the truth. You also get to decide who has been telling the truth. You will get to decide who might only have a secondhand version of events. You also will determine who has had secondhand version of the truth as well, and who is essentially trying to save themselves. Don't forget the lack of evidence is still evidence. When all is said and done, the prosecutor must have proven that their theory of events is the only logical alternative as the reason for the death of Mr. Caraballo. 
During Mr. Lloyd's opening, I was listening intently and was intrigued by a synopsis of events surrounding this incident. But again, that's his position as a prosecutor of Eaton County. With that understanding, both his and my synopsis are not evidence. This is our time to present to you how we view the case, and you take that with how you will in conjunction with the evidence, solely provided to you during the course of this trial. If there is any part of you that believes that there is any other logical theory that you're going to hear about being possible, or that the prosecutor has not ruled out beyond a reasonable doubt, then not guilty is the only verdict that you can render in this case. Further, there is also going to be a jury instruction about any testimony of any other co-defendant. This is a very special instruction that you will read concerning the testimony of Mr. Christopher McMillan, who has already pled guilty in this court to the murder of Mr. Robert Caraballo. Mr. McMillan's testimony will be afforded the following instruction when deciding on his credibility. You should examine Mr. McMillan's testimony closely and be very careful about accepting it. When you try to decide whether you believe Mr. McMillan, you have to consider the following. Was his testimony falsely slanted to make Beverly seem guilty because of Mr. McMillan's own interest, bias, or for some other reason? Was he offered a deal or been promised anything that might lead him to give a false testimony? Was he promised that he will not be prosecuted or promised a lighter sentence or allowed to plead guilty to a less serious charge? If so, could this have influenced his testimony? Does Mr. McMillan have a criminal record? This may be important for similar assault of crimes, so please be careful. The final rule of accomplice testimony states, in general, you should consider an accomplice testimony more cautiously than you would that of an ordinary witness. You should be sure to examine it closely before you base a conviction on it. Pay close attention to how many times Mr. McMillan has changed his story and how inconsistent his overall participation in this case has been. Moving forward, although motive is not an element of any of these crimes against Ms. Beverly, motive is still a very important and relevant factor of who, what, where, and any other individual's involvement, including Mr. McMillan. From the very first interaction with law enforcement, Mr. McMillan was showered with offers of saving himself. All statements from that first interview and forward are clearly self-serving and should not be viewed as credible as against Ms. Beverly. But as instructed in the accomplice testimony during instruction, lastly, on a final note, before the testimony begins, I want to leave you with an example of reasonable doubt as a frame of reference. During voir dire, Mr. Havis had given you the example of the presumption of innocence, essentially meaning that we start from zero on a gauge and the prosecutor has to fill that gauge with evidence in order to move the gauge. I'd like you all to think of that gauge of speedometer on your dashboard or whatever car it is that you drive. Now, when we're on a road, there's generally a maximum speed limit. Now, as we press our foot on that accelerator and speed up to get closer and closer to that maximum speed allowed on that road, think of that as the evidence that you hear in this courtroom, getting you to the maximum speed allowable on that road. As a prosecutor brings forth more and more evidence you have to decide if it's going to accelerate closer and closer to that maximum. But if there are things that you hear that give you a pause or slow you down, take your time to pay attention to those bits of concern. And at the close of proofs, if you feel you haven't reached your maximum allowed speed on the road of this case, then ladies and gentlemen, you have the verdict of not guilty. Now that you have that picture in your head, you are the, you are the ones to decide if we've reached our limit or not. With all that being said, thank you all for your time and drive safe. Okay, so um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's different. It's different. Um, all right, so that was the openings, of course. Um, and then let's see. So let's go to the co-defendant Chris testimony.
there's the daughter. Here we go. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you got under penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Please have a seat, sir. Thank you. The microphone in front of you does not amplify, uh, so make sure phone? that you speak loud enough that the jurors all the way to the end can hear, okay? Yes, sure. And would you please state your full name? Christopher Wayne McMillan, C-H-R-S-T-O-P-H-E-R. W-A-Y-N-E-M-C-M-I-L-L-A-N. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. McMillan, how you spoke right there is how I need you to keep your voice up during this whole time, correct? You understand? I'll try. All right, great. Let's start out with the most obviously thing about, well, there's a couple obvious things, but we'll start out with the one that I think is the most obvious, and that's your sunglasses. Why are you wearing sunglasses in the courtroom today? Their prescription. Tell me about this prescription and why you would be required to wear sunglasses. It takes the halo off of things that I can see clear. What is wrong with your eyes? I have a double stigmatism. And as part of this double stigmatism, if I were to say to you, could you please take off your glasses, would you be able to see me? No. And so has this prescription been something that you've had for a long time? Yes, yeah, since I was young. I'm going to actually show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1. For the record, Your Honor, these items have also been stipulated to, I guess for the court's ease, if there's an item that's not stipulated to, I will address it that way. It's Thank smart you. to go ahead and I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1. Do you recognize that picture? Yes. What is it that I'm looking at right there? That is Tasha and myself and sunglasses. What year is that? 2002. 2002. And those sunglasses look similar to what you're wearing today, is that right? Yes, sir. Did you have that type of prescription back in 2002? Yes. Now, next thing that's uh, pretty obvious about you is that you are wearing orange and orange jumpsuit. Yes. You are in prison? I'm in the Department of Corrections. Which means that you are at a prison. That's correct. And you have been brought from that prison today to testify, is that right? That's correct. So that we get it right up front, back in 2019, you were charged with open murder, conspiracy to commit first degree murder, and burning a body. Is that fair to say? Yes. And as a part of a resolution, you actually pled guilty to murder in the second degree, conspiracy to commit murder in the second degree, and you were to receive a minimum sentence of 15 years in prison. Is that right? Yes. And you receive that for your willingness to be able to come in and testify against other defendants. Is yes. that also correct? That's correct. And in reality, is it fair to say that you have actually testified at preliminary examinations as well as trials? Yes. <laughs> you have testified at a preliminary examination in 2019. You testified at a trial in 2021. You testified at a preliminary examination in 2022. Is that all fair to say? Yes. Now, those items were actually transcribed, is that right? Yes. You know they were transcribed because you have been actually presented with a copy of those transcripts. Yes, sir. And on top of that, you actually pled guilty in this courtroom to that murder to and conspiracy to commit murder to, is that right? That's correct. You had a plea at that time where you, you talked to Judge Cunningham about what happened. Yes. And in 2018, you were actually interviewed by Detective Mulvey, is that fair to say? Yes. That was actually occurred before you were actually ever arrested. Is that right? That's correct. But you've been presented with a copy of that. I gave you a copy of that for you to review before your testimony today. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And you and I have met and you and I have prepared as witnesses. Is that also fair to are prepared for you to be a witness? Is that fair to say as well? Yes. All right. So I'm going to take you back to 2001. In 2001, did you have occasion to come to Charlotte, Michigan? Or were you already here? I came in 2001. Where November. did you come from? Texas. And where did you come to? Uh, Charlotte. And did you know someone up here? My brother lives here in Charlotte. So your brother lived here in Charlotte, and did you decide, decide to go live with your brother up in Charlotte, Michigan? 
Yes, I had an open-ended ticket to fly back to Texas, but I ended up staying and getting a job. When did you come to Charlotte, Michigan in 2001? In 2001, it was November the 11th. And why do you remember that date so specifically? Because it was a couple months after September 11th and the airplane airports were empty. Now, after you get up here to Charlotte, you said you got a job? Yes. What kind of job did you have? Being a carpenter's helper. While you were being a carpenter, did something happen to you? I slipped on some sawdust and slid off a 20-foot roof. And what happens when you slide off that 20-foot roof? I compound fractured my right heel and broke my left foot, bulged a couple discs. After receiving that, did you go on workers comp? Yes. After that incident had happened, did you have occasion to ever meet a person by the name of Deneen Deshaun? Yes. Could you tell the jury when it was that this occurred? Uh, early March, late November, I'm, I was at a gas station getting gas and cigarettes. and. <clears throat> You just said early March to late November. Is that what you meant? Early March, late February, my bad. Early March, late February. You were at a gas station. Was yes, there a gas I'm, station here in Charlotte? Yes. What happened? So I could hear that she had a southern draw. And I was like, you know, I talked to her a little bit and went out to the truck. I went to give her my number, and she was coming out the door to give me her number. And this is Deneen? That's Deneen. Now, after exchanging numbers, do you see her again? Deneen is the defendant's daughter. That's how he got wrapped up in this. Yeah? Yes. And what happens in regards to that? We met up at a McDonald's. We talked a little bit there. We had some of the same interests. We both liked to smoke pot. So we would go to the park in different places and get high and talk and hang out. Turned into quite regular. Did there come a point in time that Deneen actually introduced you to her family? Yes. Do you remember what street her family lived on? Horatio. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 2. Do you recognize that picture? Yes. What is it that we're looking at in Exhibit 2? That's the house that I was taken to by Deneen. Picture this up on the screen. Is that the house that you went to in 2002? That's the house. In all fairness, this picture is taken in like 2015, 2016. Does it look similar to, this to yes. what you saw in 2002? Yes. Now, when you go to this house in 2002, do you have the opportunity to meet Deneen's family? Yes. Who exactly did you meet there? I met Beverly, Robert, Cicely, and Natasha. Who was Beverly? Beverly was Deneen's mother. Now, we might as well just get it done right now. This is Beverly. Do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you tell me where she is sitting, what she is wearing? She's wearing white glasses and white shawl. At the desk over there. You know, I'd ask the, uh, at well, which desk? Let's be sure that we're clear. Defendant's desk. Defendant's desk. Your Honor, I'd ask that the uh, record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The record will reflect the defendant has been recognized. So the defendant is Deneen's mother. Who's Cicely? That's Robert and Beverly's daughter. All right, well, who's Robert? Robert was the man that was killed. Now, in reality, in 2002, did you know this individual? Well, I'm going to show you a picture first. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 3. Do you recognize the photo? Yes. Who is that photo of? That's a picture of Robert. All right. Now, I call him Robert, right? In reality, in 2002, what did you know the person on that picture is? Juan Cintron. You knew him as Juan Cintron. That's the way he was introduced to me. That's the way he introduced himself to you? Yes. So Robert or Juan, the same people, right? Yes. His daughter is Cicely. Yes. Who else was actually at the house? Tasha. Now Tasha, was Tasha the same person that we saw in photo one that you were standing next to with the sunglasses on? Yes. And who was Tasha? That was Beverly's daughter from another man. Once again, Beverly being the defendant, you've yeah. already identified. Yes. So you go over to this house at 334 Horatio. Do you begin hanging out there? Yes. What exactly would you do when you hung out? We would play cards, eat, smoke. Who drink. was we? Well, it was Deneen, Beverly, myself. Robert didn't really drink. He smoked weed, but he wasn't there a lot. If Robert was there, do you remember where he liked to be 
He liked to be in the basement. Why did he like to be in the basement? That was his little place. He'd go down there and read his Bible, and he'd smoke by himself a lot. Is it fair to say that when you hung out at the house, you, you did it a lot of times when Robert wasn't there? Yes. Why is that? He didn't really care for me. Why didn't he care for you? He didn't like me being in his, in his place. Now, it's February or March that you get to know Denis, and then you start hanging out over the house. Do you remember what time frame this is? When I'm hanging out at the house? Yeah. It was in the spring. Now, did you ever have the opportunity to go into the basement? Yes. What would you do down in the basement? I would smoke with Deneen or Robert or both of them. And why would you smoke down there? They didn't want it going on in the house. Sometimes Deneen and I would smoke in the sunroom. And when Robert wasn't home, you know, just the kids were going to school, roll up right there at the kitchen table. But if they were home? Down in the basement or outside or in the sunroom. So I'm going to get right to it, uh, Chris. Well, let, let me ask this. Did, did you become friends with Deneen and the defendant? Yes. Enough that you were hanging out there a lot? Yes. Did there come a point in time that you had to really hang out there because you had no place else to be? Yes. Why is that? I was on a lot of medications, and I was at my brother's house where I was living. I fell asleep holding a cigarette, and I burned a hole in one of my sister-in-law's dad's blankets. And she went off about it. Her and my brother had words, a big fight, and they kicked me out. So I was going to burn the place down. So you began hanging out at this Horatio home because that's where you could live. I was going back and forth from Bellevue to there. You had a place in Bellevue you could stay as well? Yeah, at a friend's house. Now, Chris, I'm going to take you to in 2002. Was there ever a point in time that someone mentioned something to you about taking out Robert? Yes. And I'll just ask the question now. Do you know Robert's dead? Yes. So let's start with the fact that, well, do you know the day that he died? I know it was March, the, I mean, May the 7th. Now, in all reality, do you know that it's the date of May 7th because that's what you've seen and heard? Or did you write it down on your calendar? That's just what I've seen and heard. I didn't know the exact date. So you don't know the exact date, but do you know the day that he died? Yes. Do you know the day you died because you were there? Yes. So let's focus off the day he died. Before the day he died, was there a point in time that anyone had a discussion with you in regards to getting rid of Robert? Denny. Tell the jury how that came about. Robert and Beverly were arguing. Denny and I were in the center room. Can't tell you what they were arguing about because it was arguing in a different language. Well, let me stop you there. Did Robert and the defendant argue a lot? Yes. Verbal arguments? Physical, verbal. Physical and verbal? Yes. Did you ever see any physical? I've seen a lot of running mascara. Running mascara? Yeah, her makeup would... That run. would be on the defendant? Yes. Like she was crying? Yes. But did you actually ever see any physical altercations between the two? Never saw them hit each other. But you heard a lot of yelling? Yes. Yelling in a different language? Yes. So they're arguing, so what happens? The name told me that they wanted to get rid of him, and... Okay. I'm going to have to stop you these times, and remember, we can't say they. Tell me who they is as you're talking. Deneen and Beverly wanted to get rid of him because he was abusing the kids and Beverly physically, mentally, sexually. Deneen told me that Beverly wanted to knock him unconscious and suffocate him. While you're having this conversation with Deneen, does anyone else walk in? Beverly does. Beverly, once again, is the person you've identified as the defendant. Yes. What exactly are you? does she tell you when she comes in? She was irate. She wanted to get rid of him. She talked about suffocating him. And that all takes place during this conversation in the summer? Yes. How long do you think this, this uh, conversation took place? Three to five minutes. Wasn't, wasn't long. Not very long? No. Now, you're told that Robert's so supposedly abusing the children and the defendant. Have you ever seen any abuse of the children? No, but they're really skittish. 
skittish, but you didn't know why they would be skittish. No. So this conversation takes place. What do you think about it? I really blew it off. I didn't think much of it at all. Why is that? Because it just they were arguing. I didn't believe you know they were actually talking about Beverly and Deneen were actually talking about murdering somebody. After that first conversation, do you have another conversation regarding getting rid of Rob? Yes. Where does that take place? In the basement. Now, who is exactly in the basement with you? Deneen. What are you doing? Smoking. Smoking what? Marijuana. And while you're in the basement, are you told by anyone, hey, this is how we want to kill Robert? Yes. Who told you that? Deneen did. And what exactly were you told by Deneen? That, that Deneen and Beverly, we, Beverly wanted me to hit him in the head with a baseball bat and put the bag over his head and suffocate him. Where exactly were you going to get a baseball bat? There was a bat in the basement I played with all the time when we went down there. I used to play baseball. As far as I'd pick it up and play with it while we were smoking weed. Aluminum? Wooden. Wooden. And you said you were in your basement at 3.30 or in the basement at 3.34 Horatio. Is that right? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 4. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that we're looking at? It's a diagram of the basement. Now, in 2002, what might have been different of this sketch than what we're seeing of a sketch that's done after that? There wasn't a concrete patch there. There was no concrete patch? No. This area, though, you have the area where the victim used to sit. Are you able to see me? Yes. Was that concrete? Yes. But this area here that's called concrete post wasn't actually there when you're in the basement talking to Deneen in 2002. Right, there wasn't a concrete patch there. It was concrete, but it ran into dirt. Concrete that ran into dirt. So tell the jury what you were told was supposed to happen when you killed Robert. What did Deneen say to you? That she wanted me to stand by the post that's blacked out right there. And when he comes down the stairs, Hit him beside the head. When he knocks out, put a bag over his head and hold it with a rope. Jeez. So when you say the blacked out post, you're talking right here? Yes. Now, what are these? Are those what stairs? Yes. All right. So before we go any further, Chris, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 5. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that that we're looking at there? It's a picture of the basement stairs. Is that similar to what the basement stairs would have looked like in 2002? Yes. I'm going to show you another picture, another exhibit marked Exhibit 6. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that that we're looking at? Another view of the stairs. Would that be stairs going up from the basement? Yes. I'm going to show you a Exhibit 7. Do you recognize that? Yes. Is that how it would have looked in 2002? There wasn't a piece of plywood behind the whiteboards there. All right, so we have these are the stairs. Would you agree? Yes. And there's these white wood coming across them. Would you agree with that? Yes. But this plywood here wasn't here in no. 2002. Now, this is the post that you were talking about that you were supposed to stand by? Yes. And if you stood by that post, were you able to see up the stairs? Yes. Because the plywood wasn't there, right? That's right. Showing you what's been marked is Exhibit 8. Do you recognize that? Yes. Is that the bottom of the stairs? Yes. If you were to come down those stairs and go to your right, are you coming into that area? That would be the where Robert would have sat and where it's marked on the exhibit of concrete patch. Yes. So I'll take you back to Exhibit 4. And you mentioned that you're in the basement. And you mentioned that it's you and Deneen. And you mentioned that you're near the con or excuse me, the post that's black next to the stairs. Is that right? Yes. 
What does Deneen tell you that she wants done? That she want, Deneen wants me to hit Robert with a bat. How is Robert going to get down the stairs? Beverly was going to have him come down. So the defendant was going to have him come down the stairs, and once he came down the stairs, what were you supposed to do? I was supposed to hit him with the bat. And after he was hit with the bat, what were you told was going to happen? The bag was... You know what's scary is that there are three people who discussed this and were like, yeah, sounds like a good plan. Makes sense. This is, this is the best course of action for us to move forward. That's terrifying. I was going to go on his head and we we're going to, Deneen and Beverly was going to suffocate him. Now, while you are in the basement with Deneen talking about this, does the defendant come downstairs? Briefly. What does she say? She just wants to know if we're going over the plan. She wants to know if you're going over the plan to get rid of Robert. Yes. And this is before the day that Robert is actually killed, is that right? It's three days before. Three days before Robert's, and why do you remember that? It was about three days. We went down there and smoked again. Robert wasn't home. So Robert wasn't home three days later? Yes. Where are the kids? They're at school. Who's in the house? Deneen, Beverly, and myself. So you and Deneen decide to go down and smoke in the basement again? Yes. What happens as you're smoking? The basement door opens. Down comes Robert and Beverly was behind him. They come down a few steps. Beverly kicked Robert down the stairs. I swung the bat. I hit the post. I broke the bat. He was kind of at his knees. And he wasn't really getting up. He had his hands out like he was going towards Deneen. Deneen was right in front of him. And Beverly starts to tell Deneen, give me the hammer, give me the hammer. Well, Deneen takes the hammer and with her right hand, wants to hit him a couple times on the left side of his head. Beverly jerks the hammer away and with her left hand on the, right, the left side of the head, hits him like three or four more times until the hammer was in his head. So he was on his knees with the hammer sticking out of his head. I took the hammer, I pulled the hammer out. I'm holding the hammer. There's a hole, about a half dollar size. I turn back around and there's a bag on his head. Deneen's behind him, he's laying on his back with a rope. Deneen was holding the bag. Beverly was sitting up on top of him to keep him from moving. And he laid like that until the bag quit moving in and out and he quit breathing. Judge, may we approach for a moment? Okay. Oh. How horrible for him. Oh my gosh. He says it so I want to remind you that you are not allowed to talk to each other about the case. You're not allowed to talk to anybody about the case. Talked about my All rise. Wow. I have a seat, sir, and I, I remind you, you are still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. Very good. Mr. Lloyd. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. McMillan, when we had stopped, you had just talked about that a bag had been placed over Robert's head and a rope around his neck. Yes. A couple of things I want to ask you before we continue. You mentioned that you and Deneen did drugs. Yes. Was it just you and Deneen, or did the defendant do them as well? Defendant as well. What kind of drugs were we talking about that y'all were doing together? Oh, uh, marijuana, cocaine, alcohol. And this was taking place all before Robert was killed in 2002? Yes. I was actually buying coke from a, one of Beverly's friends. So we get to that day that Robert dies. You mentioned that there was a bat in the basement. Yes. That bat in the basement, why was it there? I don't know why it was down there. I mean, it's just something that I picked up when I, when I saw it, I'd pick it up and start playing with it. And that bat, that was a bat you played with in the basement? <clears throat> yeah. If we went down there and we were gonna smoke, I usually had that bat in my hand. Now, before I take you to exhibit nine, you mentioned two. Well, let's just walk through everything again. You mentioned on the day that Robert died, you were near a post, is that right? Yes. Now, where was the bat? It was leaned up against the post. All right, and this post we're talking about is the one that's actually identified as post and is dark on this sketch, is that right? Yes. 
because the stairs are actually going from right to left, right being the down portion, left being to this top first floor. Is that right? right. And you said the bat was left near the post? Yes. Is that what you were told to do with the bat? Yes. When had you been told to do that? Three days prior. That was during the conversation that you had with Deneen about killing Rock. Yes. So you said that you're able to look back and see up the stairs. Yes. We actually talked about that in one of the exhibits, how the paneling wasn't there at that time in 2002. Is that right? That's right. You see Robert begin to come down the stairs. Is that right? Yes. You saw the defendant actually kick him down the stairs? Yes. What happens when Robert gets kicked down the stairs? He tumbles down the stairs a little ways, and when he gets to the bottom, he's on his knees. He gets up to his knees. He doesn't actually stand all the way back up. Now, as he tumbles to the bottom, what do you do? I swung at that post. I hit the post with a bat. What did you have in your hands before you swung? I had the bat in my hand. You had the bat in your hand? Yes. And when Robert came down those stairs, you said you swung at the post. Would that be the black post that's marked here? Yes. And what happens to that bat? It breaks. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 9. Do you recognize that? Yes. What does that look like to you? Burnt piece of bat. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that we're looking at? It's like a piece of the bat. Now, this bat was located in the trunk that Robert was found dead in, in multiple pieces. Just as you see in that picture. Does that bat look like hey. the bat that you broke over that post? Yes. So, if we can go back to that sketch, please. So Robert comes down the stairs, and he's at the bottom of the stairs. You said he's on his knees, is that right? That's right. Ever able to get back to his feet? Right. Right meaning he did yes. or he did he not? He didn't get back to his feet. He did not, correct? That's correct. Robert starts here at the bottom of the stairs, is that fair to say? A little bit away from the stairs, yes. Where does Robert come out towards? Towards the concrete patch right there. Where it's marked as concrete patch is where Robert comes to, is that right? Yes. Except there is no concrete patch at that time. Right, it's where the concrete kind of ended and the dirt was right there. Concrete ended and dirt began. Is that fair to say? Yes. What do you observe next occur? He's on his knees and Beverly was yelling at Deneen, give me the hammer, give me the hammer. Well, let me stop you there. Beverly was above him when she pushed him down, is That's that right? right? That's right. So at some point she comes down the stairs and ends up behind him? That's right. Near the stairs themselves? She's behind Robert. So Robert's over here by the concrete patch and the defendant would be over here someplace? That's right. Where is Deneen? In front of Robert. By the area of the concrete patch? Yes. What do you see Deneen do? She grabbed the hammer and kind of, it didn't really look like she was doing much, but she hit him in the head a couple times with a hammer. And Beverly... Well, let me stop you. This hammer, had you seen this hammer before? No. Had you known it was down there? No. This hammer, though, you said to me, you used your right hand motion. She, yeah, she hit him on the left side of the head with her right hand. So Robert's facing you, or excuse me, Robert's facing to meaning that the left side of his head is going to be over here as he's facing, well, over here if I'm Deneen. Is that right? Yes. And you say that Deneen strikes him in the head how many times? A couple times. And you're observing this? Yes. What are you hearing as you're observing Deneen do this? I'm hearing Beverly yell at Deneen for her to give her the hammer, for Deneen to give Beverly the hammer. And what happens next? Beverly takes the hammer from Deneen and with her left hand hits Robert in the left side of the head three or four more times until it was buried into a skull. When you're talking about buried into a skull, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 10. What is that that we're looking at? That's a picture of the hammer. Now, which side? The round side. 
The round sight was placed into Robert's, well, was struck into Robert's head. Is that fair to say? Yes. It was sticking out. The claw part was sticking out there. Claw part didn't go in the head, the round part went in the head. That's correct. Where's Robert at? He's around the concrete patch. So at that point, and, and who's put that hammer in his head? Beverly. At that point, <clears throat> what do you do? I took the hammer out of his head. You physically touched that hammer? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 136. Are you able to see that? Yes. What is that we're looking at? Like a hammer. Does it look similar to the hammer that is found here? Yes. No, this hammer was found outside of the trunk where Robert was burned alive, or burned, was burned. Does that hammer look similar to the one that you pulled out of Robert's head? Yes. So now you pulled the hammer out of Robert's head. Is there any blood? There's a lot of blood. What's being said at that time? After the hammer comes out? Yes. I don't remember much of anything being said. But you're seeing things? Yes. Beverly was sitting on top of Robert. Deneen was holding the rope from behind him. His head was kind of tilted towards his chest, and Deneen had the rope from behind. Now there's, what type of bag was it? Like a plastic bag. Like a grocery bag? Yeah. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 11. What is that that we're looking at? Picture of the rope. Does that rope look similar to what you saw being put around his neck? Yes. And if I told you that this was the rope that was found around Robert's neck when he was laying in the trunk in Ottawa County, would you say that that was the rope that was used on him? Yes. It was tied around his head afterwards. Why was it tied around his head? Because there was a lot of blood. To try to keep the blood in the back? Yes. You mentioned that bag. I'll show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 134. What does that look like to you? It looks like a bag. Looks like remnants of a burned up bag? Yes, it does. And if you were told that that was the bag that was found on Robert's head, would you say that's the bag that was used around his head? Yes. So a bag is placed around his head and a rope is placed around his neck. What do you see happen then? I can see that he's still breathing. His chest was going up and down and the bag was going in and out. Deneen is still behind him holding the bag? Yes. Defendant is still sitting on his chest? Yes. Does it come a point in time that the bag stops moving? Yes. How long does that take? Uh, I don't know. It seemed like forever at the time. So now you got a dead guy in the basement. Yes. Deneen, the defendant, and you are all three down there. Yes. What do you do next? We went to the dollar store to get cleaning supplies. Before you went to the dollar store, did you do anything with your clothes? I took them off, put them in a bucket. Why did you do that? Because there was blood on the clothes. There was blood on all three of your clothes? Yes. And all three of you changed then? Yes. So you then head to the dollar store? Yes. Is that here in the city of Charlotte? Yes. Do you know where that dollar store was located? I couldn't tell you by street name. But you went to a store, and why'd you go to this store? To get bleach and stuff to clean up. Whose direction is this that you should go to the store? Beverly. What's she telling you that she wants done? She wants the blood cleaned up. And so does, who buys these items? I don't know who went in the store. But the three of you went to the store together? Yes. And do you get these items? Yes. Do you go back to the house? Yes. And who then goes and cleans up? Deneen and Beverly. I didn't go back down there. You did not go back down there. Why not? I, didn't want to, I wasn't going to clean it up. Okay, you started to talk quiet. Too. I wasn't going to clean it up. So, is this during the daytime? Yes. And you said that Cicely and Tasha aren't there. That's right. So that has to, let's say, on a rough average place at some time between like 9 and 3, is that right? It was between 11 and 1. 11 and 1 is when you killed him? Yes. Why do you know it to be during those times? 
It was about 11.30 whenever we got back to the house. When you got back to the house from being at the dollar store? Yes. Now, did there come a point in time that day that you left? Yes, it was at night. Well, in the afternoon, the girls aren't there. Right. We went got them from, I went and got them from school. And when you went and got them from school, did you bring them back to the house? Yes. What happened when they came back to the house? They were told to go to their room. Why were they told to go to their room? That they were grounded. Who was telling them that? Beverly. Now, when you got back to the house, did you notice anything about the basement door that was different than it had been when you had gone down there in the morning? There had been a padlock placed on the door. What do you mean by padlock? A little lock with the latch. You put the padlock through it and close it. And that hadn't been there before mm. Robert was killed in the basement? No. So now you mentioned, too, that later on that night you left. That's right. Did there come a point in time that you were told to go back down in the basement on the day that you killed Robert? Yes. What was the reason for that? To get the body and bring it upstairs. It was placed in a trunk. All right, so a trunk. Did you know the body was going to be placed in the trunk? Yes. How did you know that? Because it was sitting next to the bed in the, in the living room. It was kind of like turned into a bedroom, and it was beside the bed. Whose bedroom was that? That was Beverly and Robert's bedroom. And who went and got that trunk? Beverly pulled it out and got everything out of it, took it downstairs. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 12. Do you recognize that? Yes. Does that look similar to the trunk that, at least in the shape and design, of what would have been next to the defendant's bed before Robert was killed? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as people's exhibit 129. Does that, can you see that? I can see that. Does that trunk look similar to what was next to Bev's bed back in, or the defendant's bed in 2002? Yes. And if I were to tell you that's the trunk that Robert was found burned up in, in, burned up in, in Ottawa County, would you agree with me that that was the trunk that you had used to carry him out of the basement to Ottawa County? Yes. And on that note, you have no idea where you went, right? Yeah, I went from here. I didn't, I've never been more than 40, 50 miles outside of, well, St. John's was the furthest I've been out of Charlotte. So when I use Ottawa County, I had no Clearly, idea. You no idea where you actually went? No. All right, we'll get to that. So, that trunk that had been next to the defendant's bed is taken down to the basement. When you're called down, what do you see? I see that Robert's in the trunk. How do you know that Robert is in that trunk? Because it wasn't closed all the way. And I lifted the lid up and tried to close it. I couldn't get it closed. Now, when you go down to that basement, do you see the bat? No. How about the hammer that you pulled out of his head? No. Did you ever see that bat or hammer ever again? No. So you are told to help pick Robert up and take him out of the house? Yes. Who tells you to do that? Beverly. Once again, it's the defendant telling you what to do, is that right? Yes. Who does he tell, to, who does she tell to do that to? Deneen and myself. So Deneen, who is the defendant's daughter, and you then carry Robert out of the basement in that trunk? Yes. Where do you carry him to? We put him in the back of a, of a van that Robert owned. So you're using Robert's own van to carry him away? Yes. Now, what else do you do once you put Robert in the van? We put a gas can back there. Why did you put a gas can back there? Because we were going to burn the body. Who had told you you were going to do that? Beverly. So at this point, is it daylight or is it nighttime? It's nighttime. So does there come a point in time after you put Robert in the van and you've taken the gas can and put it in the van that you decide that someone decides it's time to leave? Yes. Who decides it's time to leave? Beverly. So what do you have to do to get ready to leave? We had to get the girls in the van. Now when you say the girls, who are we speaking Cicely about? Cicely and Tasha. And where are they at? They were asleep in their bedroom. And is it nighttime at this time? Yes. Who grabs who and puts them in the van? Deneen put Cicely in the van. I put Tasha in the van. Do other people get in the van? Beverly gets in the van. Defendant gets in the, where did she sit? In the middle, in the back seat. How about Deneen? Deneen was driving. Where are you? I'm in the passenger seat. Why is Deneen driving? She's the only one that had a valid license. So out of the three of you, she's the only one with a valid license? Yes. 
What would be the importance of having a valid license? You get pulled over and have the vehicle searched. Be pretty bad if you get pulled over for not having a license with the dead body in there. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <clears throat> so Denise in the driver's seat, you're in the passenger, the defendant's in the middle, and the children are in there as well as Robert. Do you leave the house at 334 Horatio? Yes. Which, by the way, at 334 Horatio house, mm -hmm. the defendant and Robert lived in that house, right? Yes. Well, how was that house? Was that house just a normal house or was it a duplex? It was a duplex. There was the first level with access to the basement and then there was a second story. What floor did the, did the defendant live on? The first level. The first one that had access to the basement? Yes. And somebody else lived up on the second floor? Yes. So you go to leave that house. Where's your first stop? You stopped at a gas station by the highway. Stopped by a gas station by the highway. Do you know what gas station it was? I couldn't tell you. What do you do at the gas station? We get gas in the van and put gas in the little gas can. And that's a gas can that you've already picked up from the house before you leave? Yes. And then what do you do? We started driving. We got on the highway. And we just talked about that. You Do you have any idea where you drove to? No. Do you have any idea how long you drove? <laughs> it was over 45 minutes for sure. But you don't have a specific time frame as to when that occurred? No. Now, did there come a point in time that someone actually told you to, told Deneen to stop the van? To pull off onto a dirt road. Who's directing you on where to go to these places? Beverly. So during this time that you're driving, wherever you're driving to, you're being directed to go there by the defendant? Yes. <coughs> and you said you pulled off a dirt road. Where'd you go after you pulled off the dirt road? To a little two-track road. And what do you mean by two-track road? Just where the tires were going was dirt and there was grass in the middle. What do you do when you get to this two-track road? There was a gate at the end of the road, so we backed up to the gate. Now it's nighttime, is yes. that right? Yes. How do you see this gate? I didn't see it until we started backing up to it. Okay, we were going to pull in it, and then we had to turn around and back up. <laughs> but when you see the gate, what's allowing you to see the gate in the nighttime? The headlights and the taillights. So you're actually able to observe the gate? Yes. Why is this gate important? We can't get in the gate. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 13. Now, you, you talked about a gate. Yep. Shown that picture to you before, is that correct? That's right. Do you recognize that picture? Yes. What does that picture look like to you? It's a picture of the gate. That, that picture looks similar to the gate that you saw when you were bringing Robert to this two-track road in 2002? Yes. So, you said that you drove in and then you turned around and backed up to this two-track road. Is that right? That's right. At that point, what do you do next? He opened the hatch of the van and pulled Robert out on a, a cushion or a piece of carpet. And we pulled him up under, Deneen and I pulled him underneath the gate. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 14. Does that item look similar to what you used to pull Robert up the road that day? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as... People's Exhibit 133. This item was found underneath the trunk where Robert was burned. Does this item look familiar to you? Yes. Same as Exhibit 14? Yes. And did you leave that cushion that you used under Robert when you dragged him up there? Yes. So you pull the cushion out of the car and you pull the trunk out. What do you do next? Deneen and I pulled Robert up the two track a little ways and then put him off in the bushes a little bit. Now that gate that you mentioned, what'd you have to do with the gate? We couldn't get through it, it was locked. So what'd you do? So we put the body underneath the pole. It was not knee high. 
Because it was that triangle shaped gate. Right. You were able to drag it underneath? Yes. So, you said that you went up the two-track road, it's you and Deneen pulling it up, and then you said, what did you do when you get to a spot on the two-track road? We took it, we drug him off the road a little bit. What did you do then? We had to go back to the van to get the gas. What happens when you go back to the van to get the gas? When we went to the van to get the gas, Beverly wanted a ring off of Robert's hand. So what do you have to do then? So we went back out to the body. Who's we? Deneen and I. Go back out to the body. Now, is Robert still inside that trunk? Yes. Trunk's pretty much still closed? Yes. So what happens when you get back out to Robert in regards to this ring? Deneen dug around in the trunk and tried to take the ring off his hand. So, trunk lid has to be open? Yes. What do you mean by dug around? His, she had to get to his hand to pull the ring off. Was she able to do that? No. Did you try to do it? No. So what happens then? We went, Deneen and I went back to the van. Beverly really wanted the ring, so Beverly and I went back out to the body. Beverly got the ring off his hand. How'd she do that? I'm not sure if she spit on the finger or how she did it, but she got it off. So what happens after that ring is obtained? We pour gas on the body. Who poured gas on him? Beverly and I. You both poured gas she on She poured him? the gas, I lit the fire. So, Gas is poured all over Robert. What kind of size gas can is this? Like a three gallon can or so. You used all that gas over Robert? Yes, put the gas can there. And then what happens next? When we lit him on fire, we took off up the road. When you say take off, were you just... No, we were moving. You were running? Yeah. So where do you run to? To the van. Beverly gets back in the middle seat. I get back in the passenger seat, Deneen drives off. What happens while well, you drive off? Where do you go? We got back on the highway. And where are you heading to? Back to Charlotte. As you go, are heading back to Charlotte, does anyone tell you that you need to be throwing something away? Beverly told us to throw our shoes out the window. What was the reason for that? For feet print around the van. He's leading a lot. So does everybody do that? Yes. Everybody being the defendant, you, and the me. Is that yes. right? So what happens? Do you end up back at 334 Horatio here in Charlotte? Yes. What happens then? It was getting about daylight. I went in and went to sleep. I took the, I went in the extra bedroom, put a chair underneath the doorknob, and I was in there for about three hours. The point that you wake up? Yes. What happens after you wake up? The name was still there. Beverly and I went to like a salvage yard and had the tires changed on the van. Why would you go to the salvage yard to change tires? For the tire tracks leaving the scene. So you want to remove any, now you don't have any shoes so nobody can show your feet and you don't have any tires that can be matched up to you. Is that what you're thinking? That's right. Does there come a point in time that Does, does there come a point in time that you are directed to go back down to the basement to do further work on it? It was a couple days later. And who's telling you to go back to the basement? Beverly. She wants us to chip the concrete up. And who's us? Denine and myself. So when you go down to the basement, I'm going to show you what's been marked. Well. We'll start with exhibit. Let's start with exhibit 15. Do you recognize what we're looking at there? Yes. What is it we're looking at? You can see the concrete, concrete patch. You can see the white paint on the post. That white that is on the post. In 2002, when Robert died, was it there? No. We painted it on there the day that you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Well, it's the day you're talking about. A couple days afterwards, yes. you say you go to the basement. Deneen and myself. You're directed to go down there by the defendant. What does the defendant want you to do in that basement? We cover the blood up. Why would you need to add paint to those walls or to those posts? Because there was a blood splatter on the post. I'm going to show you what's marked as People's Exhibit 16. 
Do you recognize that? Yes. What are we looking at? More paint in the concrete patch. All right, so I know that we're being specific. There is white paint here. Yes. There is white paint there. Was that paint there before Robert died? No. When you talk about a patch, and I'll show you more as well, we'll show it from this picture. This is concrete right here, is that fair to say? Yes. There is a lighter concrete kind of slopes down. Yes. Would that be what you call the patch? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's marked as People's Exhibit 17. Do you recognize that? Yes. Where are we at? That's the concrete patch. Is that the basement of 334 Horatio? Yes. Once again, we're seeing the white paint? Yes. Now, you're saying that the white paint that's there is because there was blood? Yes. Blood that you could see? Yes. And so who told you to cover that blood up? Beverly. Now, this patch. This patch was not there when Robert was killed in 2002? No, that's where we chipped the concrete, where it come to the dirt. There was a big, there was a bunch of blood there. So what we couldn't pick up, we had to cover up. So the concrete would have ended somewhere in here where the patch starts? Yeah. And who chipped up the, the concrete? Danina, myself. What would you use to chip up the concrete? A hammer. Different hammer than the one that was used to kill Robert? Yes. And you said you picked up the chip pieces and what'd you do with them? Put them in the bucket with the clothes. So you still have that bucket that has y'all's clothes in it from when you killed Robert? Yes. What did you do then? I mixed up the concrete, Deneen poured it out, or I poured it out and she smoothed it all down. So this concrete patch here was actually created by you and Deneen? That's right. To cover up where Robert died? Yes. Now after Robert dies, are you still staying at the Horatio home? Yes. Why are you staying there? I didn't have anywhere else to go. What begins happening after Robert dies in regards to how long you're going to stay in the Horatio? Things are being packed up. Who's, who's packing up those things? Beverly and Deneen. And what are you being told that's going to happen with them packing these things up? They were going to leave. Where were they going to leave to? We're going to go to Jamaica. Who's we? Deneen was going to go to Texas. Beverly was going to take Tasha and Sicily and move to Jamaica. What were you going to do? I was going to have to find somewhere to go. So what did you end up decide doing? I went to Jamaica with Beverly and the kids. Now, before you leave, do you have the opportunity to hear the defendant actually telling people about why she's having to leave? It was Robert left her. She he... is telling people that Robert left her, and so that's why she'll have to leave. Yes. And does there come a point in time that you actually do leave with the defendant to go to Jamaica? Yes, it was mid to late July. And how long do you, well, what happens when you go to Jamaica? Who do you stay with down there? I stayed with Beverly and the kids. Did there come a point in time that you decided to leave? I would stay gone a lot. I well, was there for a month and then I had to come back. Why did you have to come back? I had a workers' comp I had to go to court and deal with. Why did you have to stay gone a lot when you were in Jamaica? I didn't want to be around him. Didn't want to be around the defendant? That's right. So you say that after about a month you had to come back up to Michigan for workers' comp? Yes. When you came back up, did you come back up alone? No, Tasha and Beverly came. And why is that? They had to finalize sale on the house, tie up some loose ends, and then they were going to fly back. Fly back to Jamaica? Yes. And this Exhibit 1? That was taken at a hotel around the airport. And why was it taken around the hotel at the airport? Pictures just say bye. Understand, but had you taken them? Yes, I was driving them around. You were driving them around and you actually drove them down to the airport? Yes. What ever happened to Robert's van? It was sold. What was it replaced with? A uh, blue station wagon. And was that what you were driving around when yes. you took them back down? Yes. So after they leave to go back to Jamaica, what do you do? I stayed in Michigan about another week, and then I went down to Texas. 
come a point in time that you had to come back to Michigan? Yes. What year is that? 2007. Where do you end up when you come back up? Grand Rapids. Now, during this time, are you talking to people about this? No. Are you thinking about it? No. I'm going to take you to 2018. Yeah. Knock at your door. Do you remember that? Yes. Do you remember a couple of detectives being in front of your door? Yes. Do you remember them asking you if you had any knowledge of 334 Horatio or the Charlotte area? Yes, I did. How many interviews did you have with the detectives regarding this? Three. When you had that first interview, how do you feel that first interview went? It was a train wreck. Why was it a train wreck? It was the first time I've been talking about it to anybody. I was spotting all over the place. I was remembering for the first time in a long time. I never really sat down and thought, if these cops come to my door, what am I going to say? I just never thought about it. So did you, you began talking to the officers, the detectives, correct? Yes. Through these three interviews, is it fair to say that the information that you provided the jury today is what you told them that? It's a lot. Them three interviews, yes. I'm not going to say over one interview. Right. That first interview, as you said, was a train wreck. That's right. But is though through those interviews, that was what you believed had happened back in May of 2002. Is that fair to say? Yes. Subsequent to that, you were actually charged with the murder of yes, Robert Car Carbell. And you've actually pled to the murder of Car Robert Carbell. That's right. That being charged, though, and that arrest that you received because of it, those three interviews had already taken place, right? Yes. You had already told the detectives everything about this case before you ever got charged. Yes. Is that fair to say? And when you talk to them, like I said, it's the same things that you told us here today. Is that right? Yes. Hmm. Chris, during that time, did you tell the detectives that you were part of killing Robert? Yes. Did you tell the detectives that a plan was laid out by Beverly, Deneen, and you heard it to kill Robert? Yes. Did you tell the detectives that that plan came to fruition in the basement of 334 Horatio? Yes. And did you tell the detectives that it was not only you swinging a bat, but the mean hitting a hammer, the defendant using a hammer, and a bag and a rope around his head, head and neck? Is that fair? Yes. Subsequent to that, Robert was taken away to a two-track where he was burned. Yes. Hey, Kathy. And all three people, you, Deneen, and the defendant, were all there when Robert was killed on May 7, 2002, and burned that night. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> Your Honor, as I previously spoke about, uh, the uh, exhibits in this matter were stipulated to, and I would move for the admission of those exhibits. And with that, the people would have no further questions. Any objection to the exhibits that were uh, discussed and published to the jury since the break no. being admitted, Mr. Havis? No, no, no. The exhibits are admitted. <clears throat> Cross-examination of the witness, Mr. Thank Havis. You. Mellon, I want to get a bit of a backstory here to how you came to live at the Racial Street address. Who advised you to that home? Recall? Denning did. Um, now you mentioned that you don't quite recall how you met Denning. Is that right? I do remember how I met Denning. Okay. How do you? How did you meet Denning? I met her at a gas station. Okay. She was up at the register paying for some gas or cigarettes or whatever she was buying. I noticed she had a southern accent, so we talked a little bit when I was checking out. I went out to my truck, 
I wrote my number down and I was going in to give her my number and she was coming out the door to give me hers. Okay. And was it after that first meeting that she invited you back over to the, to the racial street address? No, it was, we hung out several times before I went to the hair ratio address. How many occasions did you hang out with Denise before that? Six or seven. Six or seven? She had a condo that she was staying in that belonged to her grandmother. Okay, she had a condo in Charlotte? Yes. Okay. It was fair to say that you were impressed with Denine, correct? I took a liking to her. Right. Uh, you wanted to date her, right? Yeah. Uh, you were not able to do so, though, during that period of time, is that correct? No, nope, she was dancing and she was in girls. Okay. Oh. Uh, that didn't deter you, though. You still continued to try to date her. Well, I was going to be her friend. Okay. Um, did there come a time when you actually began to live at the racial street address? Yes. When was that? That was after May the 7th. I'm sorry? That was after May the 7th. Of 2001? Yes, after the murder. You had lived there prior to that murder taking place, though, correct? I was staying in and out between Bellevue and there. She you was say you're staying in and out. Girls. You need some type of reference there. Were you there two or three days a week? Something like that. Okay. And where were you sleeping? I was sleeping in the sunroom. Were you there? Were you working during that period of time? No. Okay. So you were there during the day? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall traffic? Uh, other people may come in, in and out of the house during the daytime? Not a whole lot. Beverly had a friend. I believe her name was Mecky that would come over quite it was, often. It was what? Her name was Mecky Okay. that used to come over. You don't remember two or three younger, younger uh, girls that come over for coffee or visits frequently during the week? No. Now, prior to staying there on and off, uh, you had met the Robert or, or Juan during that period of time? Yes. Okay. And you indicated that he introduced himself as being Juan, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Was there a point in time you came to know him as Robert? Yes. Okay. And was there an occasion of why he advised you he went by Juan initially rather than Robert? Immigration. He was Dominican. Now, Robert worked an awful lot during that period of time, correct? Two or three jobs. Two or three jobs. One was delivering papers. Yes. And he worked during the day. Yes. Somebody report eighties. Now, there's been obviously a discussion about the, um, the basement being Robert's man cave, for more or less. Would it be a good description? Yes. If Robert was down in the basement, he didn't like anyone else down there. Is that true? Unless you were invited. Unless you're invited. Uh, in fact, if he was downstairs and he heard somebody coming downstairs, he would get up and meet them before they got all the way downstairs. Isn't that also correct? I really don't recall. Okay. Would you have any reason to disbelieve someone else that may testify towards that? No. Now, at the time that you were staying there off and on, there were two younger children there. Is that correct? Yes. It was Tasha? Yes. And Sicily? Yes. You recall their ages at that point in time? Nine and twelve, I believe. Okay. Now, I believe under direct examination, uh, you testified that you never saw any abuse of the children by, by Juan. Is that correct? I never saw him hit him. Okay. Did you ever see him discipline the girls in any way? Yes. Okay. Was this like a spanking or something like that? Just really stern. Okay. So not, not corporal punishment, just... I never saw that. Never saw that at all? No. By stern, so he was, he was disciplining them with words rather than action? Yes. During the time that you were there off and on, how many times do you think you interacted with, with Juan prior to the day of his death? I mean, he wasn't just straight rude to me, but I could tell he didn't like me. Okay. I, I mean, interaction was limited to smoking weed with him. Okay. Well. It ain't like we just sit around and kicked it together. We'd go downstairs and we talk about him being over in Dominican Republic and we would smoke weed, he would read his Bible. Okay. But this is back in 2001, 2002. It's not like today. So weed is a, if you're smoking weed with someone, it's a communal activity. Yeah. You, you don't smoke weed with someone that you don't get along with. Right. Okay. So you two were friendly enough for him to actually, you know, engage in that type of activity. I just had a really good weed. Okay. Oh, my God. 
Now, were there times when Deneen would join you in the basement to smoke the weed? Of course. So it'd be you, Robert, Deneen, or one? Would you prefer one or Robert? He's calling Robert. Okay. You, were there were times when you and Deneen and Robert were down in the basement? Yes. Smoking weed? Yes. Now, is it your testimony that, that my client Beverly would come down and smoke weed with you? She smoked, but we smoked upstairs. Okay. When Robert went around. Okay. So I felt your earlier testimony to a question about smoking downstairs was that Robert didn't like smoking weed upstairs. That's right. Okay. But when he wasn't around, you would break that rule and smoke upstairs. Yes. Sometimes. We did coke on the kitchen table, too. Do you recall what type of job Janine was doing during this period of time? She was working at a dealership, and she was stripping. Okay. So she was at a car dealership? Yes. Okay. This is a sales position? Yes. Okay. And the jobs that Robert worked, what do you know of those jobs? All I knew he did was the paper route. I don't know what he did in the daytime. Okay. He never talked about that? No, I never asked. He never brought it up. During this period of time when you were off and on at that Horatio Street address, how many times did you talk to Beverly? I talked to Beverly often. Okay. Aside from the times that you're saying that you, that you claim that you smoked marijuana with her? Yes. Okay. And she, she made a lot of dishes with rice. I remember that. Okay. She liked to drink wild Irish rose. Okay. So we would sit there and drink and cook and okay. conversate. Was there always plenty of food in the house? I don't know if you call rice plenty of food, but there was a lot of rice. Okay. But well, there's always meals on the table for the kids, right? Yes. Did you ever talk with uh, Beverly or Deneen about their personal histories or where they came from, how they wound up in Charlotte? Only thing Deneen would tell me about her previous life was that it was the first time that she got to use her legal name. Okay. You mean your last name? Yes, Duchamp. Now, this discussion that you have testified to about the decision to kill Robert, you testified that Deneen was the one that raised that subject with you first, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And that was in the sunroom? Yes. Okay. And that was in the sunroom that you actually stayed in? That was Deneen's little bedroom. Yeah, but I stayed in there when she wasn't there. Did they have her own bedroom? It was in the sunroom. Okay. It was made up into a little little bedroom. Okay. So when you say you slept in the sunroom, you're sleeping in Deneen's room? Yes. Okay. Were you sleeping in the same bed? No. But that was something that you wanted to have happen at some point in time? One of the first times that Deneen and I went out, we went to the condo, and she stripped down on the bed and was showing me some pictures <coughs> of her naked, and I was rubbing her shoulders. And she was drunk. That's as far as that went, as far as ever being in the same bed. So it was Deneen's idea to you to kill Robert. She's the one that actually raised the idea with you directly first, correct? She wanted me to know that her and Beverly were wanting to get rid of him. Okay. Did she tell you because she suspected Robert was molesting the, the, the kids? Yes. Did she go into detail about when that took place? No. How that took place? No. Where that took place? No. She just said, he's molesting the kids, so I want to kill him? She said that they were being physically, mentally, and sexually abused. By Robert? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you took that statement at face value? I took her at, at her word. Because you were wanting to be boyfriend and girlfriend with uh, Denise? I mean, that ain't why I took her at her word. It would be fair to say that if Denise asked you to do something, you would do it. <laughs> a little bit, but not quite. Well, I think we're a little bit there about you know, her asking you to kill somebody. You would try to do what Denine told you to do because you wanted to have a relationship with her. Is that correct? No. That is not why Robert got killed. So you decided to kill Robert because you did your own research and found out what she was telling you was true. I observed around the house how things were. My dad was an alcoholic. Okay. You just told me that you never saw Robert actually abuse the children. They were skittish. They were sorry? skittish. I'm sorry? They were skittish. They were skittish? Yes. Okay. But you, just, you testified earlier that you never saw Robert. I never saw Robert hit him. 
I heard him arguing with Beverly. I heard him discipline the kids. I never saw anybody get hit. Beverly always had running mascara, crying all the time. So your testimony earlier was that after Neen raised this issue of killing Robert, your testimony under direct was that was two or three days prior to the actual event taking place. It was correct? a week before and then two or three days before. Okay, a week before and then two or three that days? That was the sunroom. Okay. Um, and she advised me that Beverly was wanting to get rid of him. Okay. Whenever we were having this conversation, Beverly and Robert were arguing. Beverly comes into the sunroom. She's like, I want to, I just can't wait till he's gone. And she asked Beverly, uh, Deneen if she had told me yet about getting rid of him. And she said well, she wanted to knock him unconscious and suffocate him. Let me stop you there and answer my question. So Deneen was the one that raised the issue about yes. killing Robert. Did Deneen tell you how to go about doing that? That they wanted to, Deneen and Beverly wanted to knock him unconscious and suffocate him. Okay, that's not my question. What did Deneen tell you that she wanted you to do in this regard of killing Robert? She didn't say anything at that point. She didn't tell you, I want you to take the bat and hit him? Not yet. She didn't say, I want you to take the hammer and hit him? No. She didn't say, we're going to use a rope for this? She said all that in the yes, basement no, three, three yes. days after. Did she before. tell you to take the bag and put it over his head? No, she said she, she wanted to suffocate him. She wanted to hit him unconscious and suffocate him. No, she didn't mention using a bag. No she didn't mention using. Mr. McMillan, you need to answer the question that Mr. Havis asked you, okay? So, Mr. Havis, would you please restate the question? Did she tell you that she wanted you to strangle him with a rope? No. Did she tell you that she wanted you to put a bag over his head and suffocate him? No. Okay. Did she tell you after you killed Robert? The plan was to drive him to Ottawa County? No. To dispose of him by lighting him on fire? No. To put him in a trunk? No. So none of this pre planning discussion took place. It was just, we want to kill Robert. Uh, yes. And you took that at face value, that's what was going to happen. They wanted to knock him unconscious and suffocate. That's what I was told. Okay, but you were never directed yourself for that, is that what you're saying? Say that again? You were never directed, that's what they wanted you to do? Or that's not, that's not what Denise wanted you to do? She was just bringing it up to me that they wanted to get rid of him. Okay. That was a week prior to his death? Yes. And then you said there was another discussion about this three days prior to his death? Yes. Okay. So perhaps I probably didn't phrase this correctly, but so did Neen tell you the three days prior to the event of how they planned on going about getting rid of Robert? Yes. And during that time, were you directed on using a bat to hit him with? Yes. Okay. So you were going to use a bat. The bat was in the basement, correct? Yes. And you were going to hit Robert? Yes. Okay. Did they tell you what time of the day that was going to be? No. Did they tell you what day that was going to be? No. Do you recall at a, at a previous uh, testimony you gave, you did not know when this event was going to take place? That's correct. And your testimony today is you had no idea when this was going to take place either? No. Okay. Uh, did Deneen tell you who was going to use the hammer? There was no hammer in the plan. Okay. The plan was a bat? Yes. And was the plan including a rope? Yes. And the plan was including a bag? Yes. Okay. And the three day prior to this, was did the plan include putting Robert in a trunk? Yes. Okay. And was the plan three days prior to this to transport Robert to another location? Yes. And to set him on fire? That wasn't in the plan yet. Okay, that wasn't part of the plan either? No. Okay. Wow. Now, <clears throat> you said that during that period of time, uh, the name was in a relationship with a, with a female, is that correct? Yes. I think his was second degree. Robert right? did not know that, is that right? Discharge? No. Robert thought that you were the name's boyfriend, correct? Yes. And that was important for him not to know that, otherwise he would have kicked the name out of the house. That's right. Um, in any of the businesses or any of the jobs that uh, Robert did, did the name want to help Robert in his jobs? I don't, I don't know. Never had a discussion about that? No. But you're quite certain that Robert didn't, would not have condoned that type of activity by Deneen heading up there? No. Okay. Matter of fact, the, how she ended up at the house there was the grandmother found out and kicked her out of the condo. Okay. So that means that she was kicked out of the condo? Yes. Okay. And because she'd be kicked out of the condo, she felt that she'd be kicked out of the house if Robert found out? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Anywhere from that week to three days prior to this event, do you recall you and Deneen being at another gas station that Robert was at? 
No. You don't recall a conversation that took place about a week prior to this incident with you, Denise, and Robert at the gas station? No. Okay. Now, you used to testify that, um, that Robert didn't drink or didn't really drink a lot. That's right. You rarely saw him drunk? That's right. Okay. What, if anything, were you made aware of about Robert's uh, previous life before he came to the Charlotte address at Horatio? He said he was, uh, got in trouble with some drugs, did some time in the pen. Okay. He'd been to prison? Yes. Okay. Um, was he a person to be messed with? No. You would not want to fight, start a fight with him? No. Uh, he was someone who could defend himself? No, he was somebody that could have somebody else to do it. Okay. He was, he was someone that could have someone else take care of his business? That kind of guy. I'm sorry? He was that kind of guy. He was that kind of guy. Okay. Now, on the day of this event, you're saying this happened during the daylight hours, correct? Yes. That's your testimony. It didn't happen at night, it happened during the day. Right. Okay. During that day, who told you to go down the basement? Nobody. Okay. So you just knew to go down the basement and lay in wait for Robert? No, Deneen and I went downstairs to smoke. You and Deneen went downstairs to smoke? Yes. And so when you had no idea, I think you testified once before, that you did not know that the, the, the assault on Robert was going to happen on that particular day. That's right. It just came out of the blue to you. That's right. Even though it had been discussed two times prior? Yes. Now, we've seen the diagram and some photos of that basement. Um, would it be fair to say that it's, obviously, it's a Michigan basement, right? Yes. Uh, it's kind of damp and cramped as far as space goes. Yes. Small, poorly lit. Was it poorly lit, Yes. Sir? Okay. Um, you indicated at one point in time that you were stationed by what was called the black post or the black pillar. Do you recall right. that? That's down at the bottom of the staircase. Yes. There, as we saw the photographs, there is some type of uh, wood structures on the right-hand side of the staircase as you're going down that obstructs the view to that post. Is that correct? You're talking about the plywood? Yes. Well, no, 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 not the plywood. The plywood, the photo we saw the plywood, that plywood was not there back in 2002. That's right. That was your testimony there. But there was slats that were along that. The white ones. The white ones. Yes. That obstructed the view somewhat of the post. Yes. Is that why you decided to stand by the post? That's why Deneen told me to stand there. So Deneen told you to stand by the post, believing you would be, your view would be, or even coming downstairs, view would be obstructed by those slats. Yes. So you stood by the post. Okay. Now, I guess I'll back up and say that prior to today, and, and, and Mr. Boyd might have asked you this during direct, but you have testified regarding this event several times in the past, correct? Yes. Okay. You testified at the, at the previous uh, problem cause hearing, in this case itself, many months ago. Yes. Right. The small bat that you had, you testified to that you broke that bat when you swung it and hit the post. That's right. Is that still your testimony today? Yes. Do you recall testifying previously that you intentionally broke the bat? Yes. And is it your testimony today that you intentionally broke the bat that day? Yes. So your testifying today is that you didn't intend to do any harm to Robert that day? No. Okay. I know this has been covered, but I want to cover it again. Um, you were subsequently charged with a crime related to Robert's death, correct? Yes. And you agreed to take a plea bargain in that case, correct? Yes. Your case that you're in prison for right now? Yes. Part of the plea bargain were that um, you were to give truthful testimony against anyone involved in this crime, correct? Yes. And that was part of the sentence agreement connected with your plea bargain, correct? That's right. And the sentencing agreement is that you agree to a minimum sentence of 15 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections? Yes. Now, had you been convicted of the count that was dismissed, that would have been potentially life in prison. Yes. What you were charged with. Yes. So instead of that, you took a plea bargain 15 years? Yes. Do you recall... Do 
you recall what you testified to at your lead hearing, sir? Yes. Regarding this incident? Yes. During that time, did you testify that you broke the bat intentionally? I believe I told him that I swung the bat and broke it. Okay. It's a little bit different than doing it intentionally. Now, your testimony is that you believe Beverly pushed Robert down the stairs. Yes. Okay. So from where you were standing at the post, you could not see that, correct? I could see up the stairs. Those slats were in the way. That's why you were standing there. That's where Denise told you to stand, because your view would be trumped. Whenever the door opened, I looked down there and saw it. Okay. So your testimony is that Robert fell down the stairs, correct? He was pushed down the stairs. Okay. He landed at the bottom of the stairs on the, on the, floor, on the, on the floor of the basement. Yes. Was he was he flat out flat on the basement floor? It's kind of on his side. He got up to his knees. Okay. Um, you testified at a previous hearing that he was on his knees. Would yes. Be more accurate statement. Yes. So he's on his knees. Okay. He is his back is towards the staircase, correct? Yes. So he has an unobstructed view of everything in front of him. Yep. You're standing you're standing to his right behind the post, correct? Yes. And you swing the bat. As he was coming down the stairs. With the, as he was as he was tumbling down the stairs, okay. you swung the bat and you hit the post intentionally. What you're telling us today, and broke the bat. That's right. Okay. Um, do you recall at an earlier event that you testified that you were startled by all of this? Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk about the phrase "startled." What startled you about that? That he was pushed down the stairs. It startled me that it was actually going. It was happening. Okay. Is that why you broke the bat? I was startled, and I didn't want to hit him. Okay. And you're t telling us that you didn't hit him. That's you right. broke a bad intention. Yes. Okay. Did I you swung at the you? post intentionally. It broke. When you struck the post and broke the bat, did Robert look your way? No. Okay. He was looking in front of him at Deneen. What was in front of him? Deneen. Deneen was in front of him with a hammer. Beverly was yelling at Deneen to give her the hammer. She picked the hammer up. Well, Beverly, you said, your testimony is that Beverly pushed Robert down the stairs. Yeah. In order to push him down the stairs, you have to be behind him. That's right. So come Beverly down the stairs. Still, Beverly come down behind him. Let me ask the question, sir. I'll have to have time to answer. So, so Beverly is behind him. He's down on his knees on the floor, facing Denise, who's got the hammer in her hand, correct? She didn't have it in her hand at that point. Where was it? It was on the floor, I guess. It was on the floor, you guess? I don't know where the hammer was. I never saw the hammer until it was in Denise's hand. You didn't you weren't observing what Denise was doing during this time? She was looking at Robert. Robert had his arms kind of out. Well, he was on his knees, so he's on his knees with his arms out? Yes. Okay. But he was able to see everything in front of him, correct? Yes. And he was able to see Deneen in front of him? That's right. And you're saying that she did not have a hammer during that period of time? Not until Beverly told her to get the hammer. Okay. So Robert just was on his knees and didn't do anything when Deneen got the hammer? I didn't see him doing anything. It's just like he was struggling to get to her. Okay. Let me come back to that. that Beverly never came down into the basement? Probably. That might have been when you were doing the interviews with the uh, law enforcement? Sounds like it's the first interview. Okay. Let's talk about that first interview. Do you remember the detectives that talked to you on that first uh, that first encounter? This was right. back in 2018? I remember coming to the house. I'm sorry? I remember him coming to the house. Okay. That would have been Detective Ivy? Yes. Okay. Detective Mulvey. Um... Mr. Lloyd asked you that during the three interviews that you have with detectives, that your your complicity, your involvement with the death of Robert all came out. Is that your testimony today? Is that you told him what happened? Yes. Okay, but you didn't tell him what happened on the first day that you interviewed with him, did you? I didn't tell him all of it. You didn't tell him everything? No. Okay. Um, the conversation, and I'm not going to try to repeat verbatim because I wasn't there, but you were encouraged to get ahead of this thing, correct? It was mentioned. It was mentioned to... You have the opportunity to tell the story to get a deal, correct? There was no deal. He said to help yourself out. Help yourself out. Not tell us what happened. You're going to get a deal. Well, there was encouragement, encouraging words that sometimes people do things that are bad and they want to correct it, right? Yes. And this is an opportunity to correct it. This is your chance to tell us what kind of happened. 
Yes. Get out in front of this thing and help yourself, right? Yes. Only after that did you actually begin to tell what else you say happened, correct? Yes. Okay. Do you get ahead of this and tell your side of the story? Yes. He said he did for you, It was important for you to establish the narrative of what happened to these officers, correct? Yes. So that you can craft the story the way that you want it to be crafted. Well, no. They wanted my, my side of the story. They wanted your side of the story. They said they didn't want, that I didn't want them telling my side of the story. Correct. So, your story, right? That's what happened. That's the story that you told them, right? Yes. Okay. Now, you had testified that Deneen did, in fact, hit Robert with the hammer, correct? Yes. Deneen was left-handed or right-handed? Right-handed. Right-handed. So Robert's facing her, she swings the hammer, right-handed, correct? Yes. Hits on the left side of the skull? Yes. Hits him several times? Twice. Twice. Okay, fair. Hits him twice. Okay. Now your testimony was at some point in time, my client got the hammer and hit Robert, correct? Yes. Okay. How was Beverly able to get by Robert, who was down at the bottom of the stairs? She grabbed, he was on his knees. She grabbed the hammer out of, Beverly grabbed the hammer out of Deneen's hand. Okay. What type of, what type of, of a physical relationship we're talking about here? I mean, Robert's here, Deneen's out in front of him hitting the hammer. So you're saying that Beverly reached over Robert to get the hammer? Right at, right at the top of him. Okay. Did Deneen toss the hammer to her? No, she just let go of it. I'm sorry? She just let go of it. Deneen let go of the hammer whenever Beverly grabbed it. Okay. Where do you remember Beverly hitting Robert with the hammer? On the left side of the head. On the left side of the head? Yes. Back of the head or front of the head? Side of the head through here. Okay. But Beverly's behind him? Yes. Okay. Was this with the claw part or with the, the mallet part? The round part. The round part, the mallet part? Okay. You said to testify earlier that you never remember seeing that hammer before, correct? That's right. Prior to that day? Right. Okay. And you, so you have no idea how it got down to the basement? No. Okay. And if I recall correctly, using hammer was not part of the, quote, plan. That's right. Okay. What about the rope? Tell us about the rope. Where did the rope come from? It was down there with the bag. Okay. Had you seen that rope down there before? Yes. Okay. So the rope had been down, something down the basement that you'd seen before? Yes. Okay. Now, the grocery bag, I believe this is a, a Walgreens bag or something such as that. It's a, yeah, just a plastic bag. A normal plastic type bag. of plastic bag you would get if you went to a store, bought something, and put it into the bag. Yes. Okay. So these the thin, regular plastic bag. Nothing, not a trash bag, correct? Right. Do you recall Deneen trying to find a regular trash bag at some point in time that day? No. There was never a discussion about needing to get a, uh, some type of bag to wrap Robert up in? No. And your testimony today is that while all of this was going on during the day, the children were not at home. That's right. Okay. So, at what point in time did was Robert's body removed from the house? It was after dark. It was after dark of the same day? Yes. Okay. Again, back to the planning that was going on here, uh, the, the, the trunk was not part of the planning <coughs> on the seven days before, correct? The trunk was never, it was mentioned that the trunk by the bed had memorabilia in it and it had to be emptied out. Okay. Who brought the trunk down into the basement? Beverly. Okay. Now, I know how tall my client is and what shape she was in at the point in time. How tall was Deneen? I don't know. Five three, five four? I don't know. How tall are you? Five eleven. Five eleven? Okay. And how much did you weigh back then? One eighty. One eighty? Okay. And was Robert's body put into the trunk in the basement? Yes. Okay. And then the trunk was carried upstairs by you? And Denise. 
Sorry? Danina, myself. Okay. So Danina and yourself took the trunk with the body upstairs? Yes. Okay. And did you immediately go to the van and put the trunk in the van? Yes. Okay. Did you put it in the back of the van? Yes. The very back of the van? Yeah, where the seat, the back seat was up between the hatch and the back seat. Okay, so it was like there's not a lot of space there. Right. So that was where the trunk was placed? Yes. Okay. And at some point in time, did you and Deneen go and get the kids? I'm not sure if Deneen went with me to get the kids or not. Okay. Could you have gone and gotten the kids yourself? Yes. And you put them in the van? Yes. Where'd you put the kids? You mean from school? No. I'm talking when you transported, when you, after you put the trunk in the van. At night. At night. Okay. The kids were loaded up in the van? Yes. They were put on the back seat. In the back seat? Yes. They weren't put in the rear of the van? When you open the back of the van, mm -hmm. you see in the back of the seat, there's a space in there. Correct. The body was in there, the gas can was there. You shut the back hatch, you go around to the side door, come in there, then the back seat is there. That's where the girls were put. Okay. And so Beverly was sitting next to the kids? She was sitting in the middle row. Okay. So there was a back seat, the kids, middle row with uh, Beverly. Yes. And he was driving? Yes. Do you recall when you, one of the times you talked to the detective early on, you couldn't remember who was driving? Yes. Okay. It could have been you, it could have been Deneen, it could have been Beverly. Yes, know. that sounds familiar. Okay. It's your testimony today, though, that it was not Beverly driving, it was Deneen driving. That's right. It makes you feel very clear about that. Yes. Is your testimony today that Beverly put the bag on Robert? I'm not sure if Beverly put the bag on him or not. I turned around with the hammer. I had the hammer in my hand. I turned back around. The bag was on his head, and Deneen was holding the, the rope. Okay. And the rope was on the outside of the bag? Yes. So your testimony today is that in driving over to Ottawa County, you had no idea where you were going? That's right. You never had been there before? No. Okay. Now, your testimony also today was that the plan was to light the body on fire once you got there, correct? Yes. Uh, did you know where you were going to when you left Charlotte? No. Okay. Do you recall how long it took you to drive to the location where the... Not exactly. Okay. What time of the day or night was this? It was late at night. Was it dark outside? Yes. Okay. Um, it was sunrise whenever we were getting back to the house. Okay. Now, you testified that, that you came to a gate and backed up to the gate. The gate was locked. That's right. You couldn't get through. You could not unlock the gate to get through there. That's right. Uh, so you moved the trunk underneath the gate and then moved the trunk then further into the wooded area. Yes. How far away from the gate did you go? It was 11 paces in. 21 paces in and 11 paces to the side. 21 paces in? It's like 105, 110 feet. Okay. Did you decide where the location was going to be when you when the body was set on fire? No. We just did, stopped. Did, was Deneen telling you where to go? We just drug him a little ways and stopped, and then drug him a little ways out to the center. It wasn't like it just, I mean, it wasn't discussed how far to put him in there. Okay. Um, but it was just the Deneen moving the trunk out in that spot? Yes. Okay. And was it your decision to light him on fire? No, that was already planned. Beverly planned that. Okay. But Beverly was not there to actually do the lighting of the body on fire? Correct? Not yet. Sorry? Not yet. Okay. But he was doused with gasoline that you got from someplace? Yes. Was the gasoline purchased on the way to that location? Before we got on the highway, we went and stopped at a gas station by the highway in Charlotte. Put gas in the van, put gas in the can. Okay, so your testimony is, after you got the kids in the van, y'all got in the van, and you took off, you stopped after that point in time to get gas? Yes. Okay. Um, so when the body was actually set on fire, who actually lit the flame? I did. You did? Okay. You did that with a match? A lighter. Cigarette lighter? Yes. A big lighter? Yes. 
or a Zippo? It's a big lighter. Big lighter. Okay. You got to get pretty close to that. I had to pour a trail out. Okay. And who else was standing there when this took place? Beverly. Where was the name? The name was back at the van. Okay. Are you sure about that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, in driving back from the location to Charlotte, who was driving? Denny. Denny was drove all the way back? Yep. Okay. Now, under... Sometime during the uh, three interviews you did with detectives, I don't remember what was under direct or previous testimony, you made a statement about this is the first time that you talked to anyone about this. Is that correct? Yes. That was in 2018? Yes. That's not true, is it? Yes, it is. Do you remember talking to Monica Smith? No. Did you remember talking to Beth Bailey? You mean Sarah Bailey? Sarah Bailey, sorry. No. You don't remember talking to them at all? No, nope. not about this. Not about this? No. Okay. So those two individuals, would I have any idea what happened here? I did a lot of drugs back then. I mean, I don't so know. You may have said something? Anything. What's that? What type of drugs were you doing back then? You said some marijuana cocaine. Your Honor, I'm going to object at this point. Neither witness is on, this, uh, is on his witness list. So any information that he would be talking about or testifying to at this particular moment would be information that would not actually be coming into this courtroom today. Mr. Ames. I believe that he, if his memory was jogged sufficiently, he might remember the conversations that he had with these people, which would correct his earlier testimony. That's simply put. If he's saying that he was on drugs and doesn't remember, that's all he needs to tell me. And that's what he said. Okay. Now, the testimony is that after this took place, did you go back to living at the Horatio Street address? Yes. Okay. And you helped clean up the, uh, the crime scene down in the basement? I helped paint over the posts, and I helped put the concrete, concrete patch down. Okay. Um, did you help with the concrete patching or not? I mixed it up and poured it out of the bucket. Deneen molded it, shaped it okay. in there. How long did you stay at that uh, Horatio Street address? Till mid-July. Okay. Uh, this is 2002. I thought you went to Jamaica earlier than that. No, it was mid-July. Do you recall previous testimony where you said you went to Jamaica from May of July of 20, 2002? From May until July. We went in July. Okay. Got I stayed at the, at, the, at the residence from May until July, and then went to Jamaica in July. Okay, so you didn't go to Jamaica in May? No. That's your testimony today. You didn't go to Jamaica in May? Right. Your Honor, I'm going to object. If he can't provide an actual document, then he can't just say that's your testimony today because he never actually said that he's gone to Jamaica in May. I'm just asking a question. What? Okay, please. Is your objection improper impeachment? It is, Your Honor. Mr. Havis, respond. I'll withdraw the question. Questions withdrawn. Go ahead. How long did you spend in May? A month. A month. How'd you get there? Fully. Okay. Uh, did you pay for the trip yourself? Yes. Okay. And the purpose of the trip was vacation? Well, that's what we we're telling people. Okay. Um, you spent time with Denise while you were down there? No, she didn't go. She didn't go. You spent time with Beverly when you were down there? Yes. She was meeting a guy that she has known for like 20 years. His name was Ronnie. I'm sorry, what'd you say? She was meeting up with a guy named Ronnie okay. that she had known for like 20 years. Okay. So we were there for like three days and this tall Jamaican dude comes up and he's got dreads, really big dreads passing his knees. He sold me a pound of weed for 20 bucks. Okay, all right. When you returned from Jamaica, did you return to Charlotte? For about a week. And then you moved to Texas. I was in Charlotte running around with Beverly, took her to the airport. I hung around in Battle Creek for about a week, and between there and Bellevue, and then I went down south. Okay. Then you stayed there until sometime? In 2007. You moved to Grand Rapids? Yes. $20. He dreads to his knees. Oh, Lord of mercy. Was there a discussion, and I don't recall under direct, but do you recall any use of gloves during this incident? When we were cleaning up. When you were cleaning up. 
You didn't have any gloves on prior to this? No. Okay, you didn't have a glove on when you were holding the bat, for instance? No. Um, do you recall putting the bat in the trunk? No. I didn't do any of that. Do you know how the bat got in the trunk? Beverly or Deneen put it in there. Okay. You're saying you didn't do it? I didn't do it. So you didn't have any gloves on when you, your testimony earlier was that you removed the hammer from Robert's head, correct? That's right. You, didn't, you weren't wearing gloves when you did that? No. I was wearing gloves when we were dragging the body out. He says that like it's nothing. Now, from the time that you arrived back in the States in Jamaica, did you ever have any occasion to speak with Deneen again? I talked to her one time. One time. Do you remember what year that was? Uh, 2003, 2004. 2003? Okay. Where were you living during that period of time? I was living at home in East Texas in East with Texas. my mom. Okay. Um, and did you ever, ever have an occasion to speak with Beverly after that period of time? No. Nothing further. Redirect, Mr. Lloyd. You, Your Honor, thank you. You mentioned this gate that you went to and we, we looked at the picture of the, the two track. You said that there was a chain and a lock on it. Yes. Do you know if it was actually locked or do you just know that there was a chain and a lock on it and you felt you had to go underneath it? I didn't check it to see if it was locked. I saw the lock and the chain. Just assume that it was locked? Yes. Then you can go back to the other picture. Mr. McMillan, we previously talked about People's Exhibit 8, correct? Yes. Now, you had been told twice about killing Robert. We agree on that, right? Yes. After that second time in the basement, did you try to stay out of the basement at all? I didn't go down there for three days. Why not? I didn't want to be in there. Why? Because I didn't want to do this. Then why did you end up there on that day? If Robert wasn't home. Because Robert wasn't home, so it was okay to smoke in the basement. Yes. Now, when we talk about these are the stairs, this white area coming in a diagonal shape, is that right? Yes. This board is here. It's white. Yes. Goes across horizontally. And there's a second board. Is that fair to say? Yes. This brown stuff underneath it, you said, wasn't there in 2002, correct? So did that leave an ample amount of room to actually be able to see up the stairs? If you got in the right angle, you could see up them stairs. So on that day when Robert came down to the basement, you were in a position that you could actually see him? Yes. You were in a position to actually see the defendant push him down the stairs? Yes. Now this is the area at the bottom of the stairs? Yes. And this is the area that you said Robert fell? Yes. And then came towards Deneen? who was at the bottom of this picture. Is that fair to say? Yes. So there was plenty of room for Beverly, the defendant, to walk down behind. Yes. Plenty of room for her to take her left hand and strike the left side of Robert's head. Yes. And that's what you say happened, is that right? Yes. That would have been nasty. <laughs> yeah. Now you were asked how Robert acted when he was alive at the house. You remember that? Yes. Was Robert violent? Was Robert abusive? He was stern. How was the defendant? Drunk. Drunk? What do you mean by drunk? She drank every day. And what happened when she drank? She would start talking in another language and crying. So she had mascara running all the time? Yes. Was she also doing drugs? Yes. I was doing drugs with her. And you were doing drugs with her. And do you remember that first conversation that you had with the detectives? It was a train wreck, right? Yeah. But do you remember that in that first conversation you actually said, I remember Beverly hitting Robert in the head with a hammer? 
Yes. Now, Mr. McMillan, you said that you didn't want to be in that basement, but you ended up being there. Yes. You swung the bat at Robert. Yes. A hammer was put in his head. Yes. He was struck by both Deneen and the defendant. Yes. A bag was put over his head and a rope was put around his neck. Those are things that you've looked at this morning. Is that right? Yes. And after that happened, who is the person who was directing you and Deneen to do everything in regards to how to kill and get rid of Robert? Beverly. She watched a lot of crime shows. And from those crime shows, do you believe that's how she had the idea to come up with what y'all did? Yes. And it was accomplished? Yes. Once again, so I'm clear, when you say the word Beverly, you're talking about the person that you've identified here today. Is that correct? Yes. And let's be fair, you don't look the same way that you did in 2002, do you? No. That picture that you had up there shows you with a little shorter hair. Yes. When you saw Deneen last, she probably didn't look the same as you saw her in 2002. Is that fair to say? It's fair to say. I mean, who does? And as you look at the defendant today, does she look the same as she looked in 2002? No. Everyone looked different. But would you agree with me? Everyone seemed to have the strength to be able to carry out this murder and then carry away Robert's body and light him on fire. Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Um, is the defendant excused? A defendant, excuse me. Is the witness excused? Yes, by the people, Your Honor. Is the witness excused, Mr. Havis? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Excuse me, released at this time. Yes, right? he is released, right, Mr. Havis? Yes. He is released. Thank you. shaking her head <sighs> um all right let's see Here we are. Okay. Um, so that was, of course, the um, co-defendant. I mean, co-defendant. They're not like it's not a defendant anymore. He was convicted. He took a plea deal. Okay. So um, all right. Uh, the defendant's daughter. Sicily uh, Carabao took the stand to testify about her memory of the night her father disappeared. Okay, so this is our next one. So she was nine. Please read my PCA message above. What did I miss? What did I miss? Um, uh, she was nine when this happened. Let's get her video. He has double astigmatism, so he had to wear glasses. All right. Um, all right. Um, daughter, here we go. So, um, so Cicely was nine years old, so she gets up here and gives what she can remember from this, from what happened. Um, so we, like, she talks about being, like, woke up and, you know, being drug along on this van ride, um, 
So when she started asking about her dad, this is the one who I said that she asked about her dad and, um, and the defendant was like, oh, well, he left to go, you know, go back to selling drugs up in Canada. But then when she tried to talk to her family looking um, for her dad, um, they were like, uh, we haven't heard from him in all of these years. So uh, that's when she started to kind of get um, suspicious. She confronted her mom and um, uh, what else? Oh, she said the defendant told her she struck her husband with a crowbar and he bled profusely from his head. Her mother blamed her half-sister, Deneen, and her friends for Caraballo's death. So this is the daughter. She was nine years old at the time, y'all. Nine years old. And remember, they had, uh, the way that they, when they dumped him and the way that they burned everything, it took... 13 years for them to even identify him. 13 years. And that's because of the documentary. I cannot even imagine. Like, the, oh, gosh. I, I can't even imagine what that would be like for this poor child. I mean, I know she's not a child anymore, but you know what I mean. Still. So, this is Cicely. Cicely Caravaggio. Would you spell your last name, please? C-A-R-A-B-A-L-L-O. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Tetloff. Right. Thank you, Ron. Um, Ms. Carabayo, I've uh, known you as Sicily now for a few years. Yes. Would you be offended or would it be okay if I continued to refer to you as Sicily for this case? That's fine. All right, thank you. And uh, before today, uh, would you agree that you and I have talked before? Yes. Okay, and you've testified in uh, trial before. It would have been against Denis Ducharme, uh, where I've also talked to you and I've met with you and I've gone over stuff in this case. Correct. Okay, and I've also talked to you leading up to this case. Um, we are going to testify today uh, instead of against Denis, and now it's against Beverly McCallum. Yes. All right. She looks and like I'm just going to get this out here right at the start. Who is Beverly McCallum? My bi biological mother. Okay. All right. So. I'm going to take you back to 2016. I believe it would have been October 3rd of 2016. Do you remember that date? Yes. Okay. Do you remember whether some detectives at that point showed up at your door? Yes. Do, who do you recall those detectives were? Detective Donker and Detective Malby. And did you have an opportunity to talk with them and do an interview on them on that date? I did. All right. And it's my understanding, if you recall, uh, would you agree that this interview was quite lengthy? Yes, it was very long. Okay. And during this interview, did you tell Detective Maltby and Detective Donker things about what you may or may not have remembered back from 2002 and then again at a later date? Yes. Okay. And uh, this, uh, this interview, did there come a point that Detective Maltby and Detective Donker actually told you that your father was indeed deceased? Yes. Okay. How did you take that? I was 16 weeks pregnant, hormonal. I didn't take it well. Okay. Um, but you did talk about what you did remember from when you were a young girl? Yes. All right. Let me take you back to May of 2002. Do you recall, maybe not the explicit date, but that time frame of your life? Yes. Okay. Where were you living then? Um, in the Horatio home here in Charlotte. Okay. How do you know uh, it's a house on Horatio? Um, I, I remember the street. Okay. Can I approach you on? <laughs> Sorry. Ah. I hate it. Yeah, she has amazing hair. Now, back when you were living at this Horatio home in 2002, who were you living with at the time? It was um, my dad, my mom, my half-sister Tasha, myself, and then uh, my other half-sister, Deneen, on and off. Okay, and your dad, what was his name? Roberto Caravaggio. Okay, and we've also heard today uh, that he was also called Juan Cintron. Yes. Do you recognize that name? Juan Cintron, yes. Okay. Um, how did he come about having that name and also the Robert Caraballo? Um, it was an alias from when he came to the U.S. from Dominican Republic. Okay. And so is Robert Caraballo, is that his actual birth given name from the Dominican Republic? Yes, that's his native name. Okay. And I, I can't help but notice today as well that your last name is Caraballo. 
Yes. And I can't do the role of the R that you can, but uh, is that based on his last name as well? Yes. Okay. Your mom at the time, you indicated that was Beverly? Yes. And do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes. Where is she sitting? And describe what she's wearing, please. Right there, and she has a purple scarf, white glasses. All right, thank you. At the defense table? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I would ask that the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. The record will so reflect. All right, thank you, Your Honor. And you also indicated that you have a half-sister, Tasha? Yes. And another half-sister, Denise? Yes. She's okay. so pretty. Um, what was Tasha's full name, if you recall? Tasha Chardet Bayam. Okay. And so that was uh, your mom's daughter, but some other father? Yes. Not Roberto? No. Okay. And Denine, what was her full name? Denine Rochelle Ducharme. Okay. Once again, um, she was a half-sister to you? Yes. Okay. Did she have a, a separate biological father from Roberto as well? Yes. Okay. And would that would have been separate from Tasha as well? We all had different dads. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of photos with you. Because I'm going to ask a little bit about your life back on Horatio Street back in 2002, okay? Yes. Um, now, at that time, tell me about your dad. It was the first time that he was living with us full time. Um, It was one of the first times in my childhood that I remember actually being involved in extracurricular activities. He, what do you mean by extracurricular activities? He um, would take me to uh, gymnastics and swimming across the street from the Horatio home at the recreational center. And he got me involved in playing softball. He was a big baseball fan. Um, I hated it at first, but I grew to love it. Baseball or softball? Softball, yeah. Okay. I'm showing you what's marked as people's exhibit number 18. Do you recall this photo? Yes, it's my favorite. That's your favorite photo? Now, who provided that photo to our office? I did. Okay. And who was this a photo of? My dad and myself when I was a baby. Okay. And is this one of your earlier memories or one of your father ones of your father? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm showing you what's marked as People's Exhibit number 19. Do you recognize this photo? Yes. Who was in this photo right here? My mother and my father. Okay. And is this, uh, you were quite a bit younger at this photo than probably nine. Do you know about how old you were here? Maybe six. So a couple years before? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you say your mother and your father, your mother would be Beverly? Yes. And that would be the defendant? Yes. Okay. And then your father, that would be Robert Caraballo? Yes. Okay. And then People's Exhibit number 20. Do you recall this photo? Yes. Okay. Who was this a picture of at the time as well? My father. Okay. Now, you indicated he had some hobbies. Uh, do you recall what your dad did for work about that time? Yes, he was a handyman, so he did odd jobs um, when people needed help, like in the community and things around their home. And he worked for the local newspaper routes. I helped him sometimes. So. Okay. So would it be safe to say he had multiple jobs? Yes. Do you recall whether your mom was working at the time? No. She was not? Not that I remember. Okay. And uh, you indicated your dad uh, had hobbies of baseball, things like that? Yes, uh, okay. he liked watching baseball, um, pretty simple guy, read the Bible, write letters to his family in DR, or be on the phone with his family in DR, nothing else really, just around us, our immediate household. Okay, and you said DR, do you mean the Dominican Republic when you refer to that? Yes, I do. All right. And who would he typically write letters to or talk to on the phone with in Dominican Republic? His siblings, and especially his, his mother, my grandmother, my abuela. Okay, you call her abuela? Yes. And would that be Spanish for grandmother? Yes. All right. I am showing you what's marked as People's Exhibit number 21. Do you recognize this photo? I do. Okay. Who is this a photo of? My parents and my grandmother at my dad's side. Okay. So would this be the same abuela or your grandmother that you just referred to and you just told the jury about? Yes. Okay. Was he close with his mom? Very. Okay. Would this be somebody he would talk to? Uh, and write pretty much consistently and constantly? All the time. Okay. Um, and then this photo right here, People's Exhibit number 22. Do you recognize this photo? Yes. Okay. Who is in this photo? Um, my mother and some cousins on her side of the family, my father and myself. Okay. In this photo right here, it appears that you're actually a little bit older in this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
do you recall when this was taken? Um, that was one of the last Christmases I remember with him. Okay, so it was it Christmas possibly time. the Christmas before that your dad ended up missing. Correct. <clears throat> now you indicated that uh, your dad was a baseball fan. Yes. Any particular team? He loved the Cubs. He was a diehard Cubs fan. He loved Sammy Sosa. Sammy Sosa was a player native to the Dominican Republic as well. So he's really proud of Sammy Sosa and the Cubs. All right, thank you. I'll show you what's exhibit number 23. Have you seen this photo before? Yes. Okay. Who is this a picture of? My father and his right. Cubs hat. And this would be his yes. Cubs hat? And that was his favorite team at the time? Yes. All right. Now, you indicated that he had an area that he would typically hang out at in yes. the house. Where was that about? It was down in the basement. That's where he would speak on the phone with his relatives and write his letters privately, read his Bible privately. Okay. Would it be safe to say that area his in the basement would have been his man cave? Yes. I think you've referred to it before in the past? Yes. Okay. And uh, so your dad was working. Your mom wasn't working. Do you recall that your sister, Deneen, uh, being at the house on occasion? Yes. Okay. Where would she stay? There was a sunroom in the back of the house. Uh, she would stay there on and off. All right. And you recall a Christopher that would also stay at the house? Yes. All right. Describe him. Um, the way I remember him, he was a lanky country boy with like a bowl cut um, haircut, wear glasses, and he always had his guitar. Okay. He was always playing his guitar. Would he, would he sing with it too or just play the guitar? He would sing. Okay. Any good? I don't remember. <laughs> Um, do you recall him being at the house with Deneen? Yes. Okay. Was he ever at the house when Deneen wasn't there? Yes. Okay. Um, did he start off as Deneen's friend? Yes. Was there a point that uh, he was Bev's friend too? I would say so. Okay. Why would you say that? He was, you know, an adult. He would come around without Deneen present. Uh, he would stay in the sunroom sometimes without Deneen even there. They would be talking and drinking, uh, playing cards at the table together, just him and my mom. Um, so yeah, most okay. of the time, Deneen's friends end up becoming friends with my mom, having their own separate relationship with my mom. Okay, and that's something that you witnessed personally or you observed? Yes. All right. Now, eventually, when you talk to detectives uh, when they were at your house in 2016, you told them a memory that you had from 2002 about the last time you remember seeing your dad alive. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. What is the last thing, or what's the last thing that you remember prior to your dad disappearing? I remember my mother telling me to, after school, to go home and change into, into my play clothes. And once I did so, I could go and bake cookies with the neighbor kid. Um, he and his dad shared a backyard with us at the Horatio home. And I remember that my father was adamant about me staying home with him and spending time with him. But at that time, like I said, he, he was barely a full-time parent in my life. I was used to taking direction from my mom and not him. So I did as my mom told me. And I, after changing into my play clothes, I went over, I ran uh, uh, through the backyard to go bake cookies. Okay. And you were nine and you wanted to bake cookies? Yeah. Okay. I don't think anybody can fault you on that. <laughs> um, you indicated that uh, you were used to taking direction from your mom. Yes. Who was the primary, uh, I guess, parent in your house? My mom. My mom was always the matriarch in charge of the household. Uh, like I said, sh uh, my dad, he hadn't been with us full time before, so it was always just her um, in control of the house. Okay. And was your mom the one that, uh, the one that would typically tell Roberto what to do as well? She was like. She, she, she's really hard-headed and a strong personality, and he's more of like a quiet guy. So I don't ever remember us doing something that my father wanted us to do. It was always at her wishes and her direction. Thank you. And what was the relationship between the defendant, your mom, and Deneen at that time? Um, my entire childhood observing their relationship wasn't a typical mother-daughter relationship. It was more like, like a wingman or a henchman. Um, 
it wasn't a, a, a healthy mother-daughter relationship at okay. all. Okay, and who would be the one that would be in control of that relationship? My mother. Okay, and so what do you mean by henchmen? I just recall, you know, Deneen doing things that my mom asked of her, whether it was to, you know, beat someone up or something. I witnessed a lot that I shouldn't have when I was a kid. Okay, and that was at the direction of my your mother. mom, the defendant? Yes. All right. Now, there was an incident in 2002, uh, around the last time that you saw your dad alive. Do you remember sometime in the middle of, middle of the night, getting up and then going somewhere? Yes, I remember um, being startled out of my sleep and rushed into our family van. Um, I was used to the turmoil, so somewhere along everything, I, I was asleep in the back of the van. I know we were driving for quite some time, just because I know Charlotte is a small town, and we were in there for a while on the road. Um, the sky was like early morning or late at, late at night, like past midnight type time of day. Okay, and uh, you don't know, would it be safe to say you don't know where you went? No. Okay, and did something happen that night? Uh, would you agree with me that this was a long time ago? Excuse me? Would you agree with me that this was a long time ago? Yes. Okay, and at that point, you're a little girl. You were nine years old, yes. approximately. Eight or nine years. Okay, and uh, do you remember what you had for breakfast three weeks ago? No, I don't. Okay, is that a significant event in your life? Definitely. Breakfast? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you agree what you're telling the jury today would be a significant event in your life? Yes. Okay. Would this be something that would make it easier to at least remember from that time? Yes. All right. What do you recall uh, happened next that night? Um, like I said, I remember oh. falling asleep and being woken up by an explosion in the woods was the next I recall from that night. I sat up and looked out the back of the window where the explosion was coming from. I noticed my half-sister running from the woody area away from the fire. Our van was already pretty much moving. The door was open, and she was trying to catch up to the vehicle as, as if it was a getaway van. Um, before I could ask or even be too concerned about what was going on, uh, my mother told me to lay back down and go to sleep, so I did. Uh, again, I was used to the turmoil, so okay. I was too scared to ask questions. I laid back down and went to sleep. So basically what your mom said went? Yeah. Okay. Has that been consistent throughout your entire life? Yes. Now, <clears throat> do you remember at this time, uh, you indicated that you were in a van. Who was with you that you recall being in the van at that time? My half-sister, Tasha, my mother, and my half-sister, Deneen. Okay. And do you remember, because we already talked about an uh, individual named Chris. Yes. Do you remember Chris even being in this van? I do not. Okay. Uh, would it be possible that he could have been there? Yes. But you don't remember that? No, I don't remember, like, all the bodies that were in the van. I, no. um, like, if there was extra, I, would, I wouldn't really know. It's not. I don't recall, like, seeing the passenger seat or something. Okay. Fair enough. Um, do you recall getting home the next day? Yes. Okay. And... Uh, did you ever talk to your mom the next day about what happened to your dad or where your dad was? My mother told me and my sister, Tasha, that my dad had taken off to Canada to go back to his old life without us. Um, and so I, I just remember feeling strange about everything. Right, let, me, um, let me cut you up there. How did that conversation come about? What Did you ask your mom? Did your mom just volunteer that information? I don't recall how the conversation went about. Um, it could be possible that she volunteered the information. Okay. But you just remember her saying it. You don't know how that came about. Exactly. Okay. She told you that your dad went back to his old life in Canada. Did you think that was odd? Yes. Why? What, uh, what did you observe around your house that would make you think that? Um, a part of my regular routine was to come home after school and go to the basement to greet my father and let him know that I was home. So there was a padlock, and it wasn't accessible anymore. Um, you know, although she told me that he took off to Canada, I at the time could connect that Canada was within driving distance, and his vehicle was still in the driveway. So okay. I thought that was strange. Now, did he have one or two vehicles? He had two. He had his uh, newspaper routes uh, vehicle, and then he had a Volvo uh, hatch hatchback, a uh, silver Volvo. Okay, and then this uh, paper out vehicle, would that have been the van? Yes. Okay, would this have been the same van that you were riding in? Uh, I believe so. When you woke up in the middle of the night to this fire explosion? I believe so. Okay. <clears throat> so.
So neither of those are there. Um, so at this point, and so at that point, both of those cars are still in the driveway is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Okay. And your dad's not there? No. All right. What about any of his other stuff, like personal memorabilia, things like that, that may or not, may not have been there? Did you still observe some of his items around the house as well? A few of his belongings, yes. What's that? A few of his belongings, yes. Okay. Would they have been items that if he had taken off, uh, he would have grabbed? Most likely. Now, I'm showing you a couple of things from the house. First off, people's exhibit number 14. Do you recognize this photo? I do. How do you recognize it? Um, we had a dining room table set of chairs with that type of pattern. And my father took one of the chairs down to the basement and it kind of just stayed there okay. uh, to use it. So this would be a pattern of some, a pattern of what? Uh, is it, is like a seat cover to one of the chairs. Okay, like a cushion. A cushion. Okay. And that's something that you remember actually being at your house? Yes. All right. And I'm showing you, Mark, what's uh, already been admitted is people exhibit number two. Do you recognize this photo? Yes. How do you recognize that? That's the home that we lived in. Um, we took, like, occupied the bottom floor of the house. Okay. And you indicated you occupied the bottom floor of this house. Yes. What do you mean by that? The first door, I mean, um, story, I remember she we had a neighbor nine. that lived above us. Okay. Like a single woman and her dog. So your family lived on the first level, and then you had somebody else that lived upstairs. Yes. So All right. young. Now, do you remember a time after your dad disappeared that you moved away from Michigan? Yes. Where did you move to? Jamaica. All right. Who went with you to Jamaica? Myself, my half-sister Tasha, our mother. And do you recall a, the Chris that we discussed actually being in Jamaica at some point? Yes, I do. Okay. Would this have been soon after uh, that you had gotten there? It was in the same um, period that we had relocated. I remember him visiting for a few weeks. It was a lengthy visit. Okay, so longer than a week? Yes. At least a couple? Yes, All a right. few. And you indicated that uh, you went to Jamaica. Do you know or do you recall how soon after uh, your dad disappeared that you relocated to Jamaica? It was pretty abrupt. Like Everything was happening very quickly. Um, I remember just things changing from one day to the next. It was the first time in my childhood that we were near family. Um, the first time I could recognize faces at my school, I had cousins that went to the same school. We, for the first time, were sharing holidays with extended relatives on my maternal side of the family. I, I thought it was finally my like, time that we were going to settle down. Okay. Aww. And you indicated that it came to an abrupt end? Yes. And then shortly after, you're now living in Jamaica? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm showing you what's marked as People's Exhibit number 25 and 26. Do you recognize, I'll start off with 25, that photo? I do. How do you recognize that? Uh, my mom had a few of those uh, with, like, pictures and memorabilia that she was collecting over the years. And, like I said, she had a few of them. We, we always, we moved a lot, but we always moved with those Okay, these of, trunks yes. that she had. Yes. And I'm showing you with People's Exhibit number 26. Oh. And can, would you agree that this is a close-up of the label that would have been on People's Exhibit number 25? Yes, we okay. moved to Rosemont, Montego Bay, Jamaica. Okay, so when you left Michigan here, you actually moved to that address in Jamaica? To Rosemont, yes. Okay, and this would have been on your mom's trunk for when you were there? Yes. All right. How long were you in Jamaica, do you recall? A few years. And when you moved there, who did you meet up with? We met up with uh, Riney, who was her long-term love affair, I guess you could say. And we ended up moving in with him under the same roof full-time when we had relocated to Jamaica. All right, thank you. And at some point, did the defendant and Riney get married there? Yes, as I recall it, um, we had moved during the summertime. By that fall, she was getting married to him and my little brother, uh, Gaetano. He was born that following January. 
It was 2002. Now, at some point, did you recall moving back from Jamaica and coming to Texas? Yes. About how many years after you moved there was that? It was a few. I want to say like maybe 2005, 2006 time frame. And uh, when you came back to Texas, do you recall how you arrived in Texas in the United States? Yes, I uh, traveled by myself. My half-sister, Deneen, and her partner at the time picked me up from the airport in Houston, Texas. And I recall spending the weekend with Deneen's partner while she went to the border of Mexico to pick up my mom. As I understood it, my mom was flying in through Mexico or to Mexico and then crossing the border that way to come to Texas. All right, thank you. Now, you moved back to Texas. This is sometime in 2005, 2006. Yes. Who are you living with? We were staying with Deneen until we got back on our feet. Um, okay. My mom got a place that we all fit in. <laughs> well, how long did that take? Do you recall? I don't recall. Okay. And uh, at this point, it's been a couple of years since you've seen your father. Yes. Did you ever ask your mom if she'd ever heard from your dad? I pretty much was a little brown girl being raised by everyone with different color than me. So I had those moments of wishing that my dad was still here, that somebody that looked like me was there. Um, so I know it came up a lot in my childhood, and every time she would just kind of scare me away from the topic of, like, if he found out where we were, he'll steal you from me. You never want to see me again. Is that what you want? You know, things like that. Um, or, like, if I was to be disciplined or, or something, she'd say, like, I should send you to go live with your dad so he could, you know, take, like, um, take care of you or, you know, like, as if he would be more hard on me com with the, the disciplining compared to her. So it's safe to say that your mom kept up this uh, story of your dad leaving your entire upbringing? To Canada to go back to his old life. Uh, she never offered more information than that. That's all I know. All right. And uh, at some point... Did you try to get in touch with your Dominican side? Um, there was a few times in my uh, juvenile stages of life that my people would try to contact me through social media, and I would mention it to my mom, and she would just shut it down. She would make me deactivate my page, or you know, I would I would um, want to be on there with my classmates, you know, MySpace, Facebook, what have you. And the only way she would agree to me having an account is if I use like an alias or a different name. Um, so then I kind of adopted the name Sissy Lee, like first name Sissy, last name L-E. Okay, and who came up with that name for you? My mother. All right, so she told you to use this alias, and she was the one that created the name for you? Yes. All right. <clears throat> and uh, let me fast forward then to 2014. Do you recall meeting up with any extended family from the Dominican at that time? In 2014, my paternal cousin from my dad's side of the family, Madione Sedeño, she reached out to me on Facebook. Um, we had connected on FaceTime. At that time, I was living on my own with my partner in West Texas, San Angelo, so like seven hours from where my mom was residing at the time in Houston. And I you know, took that leap of faith to reconnect with my paternal side of the family. Okay. Um, we didn't meet up until um, after my grandmother had passed away. All right, let me cut you off right there. Um, when did you actually move out from your mom's house? As soon as I could. I remember turning 18 and her beating my vehicle with her walking cane because she had came home to find that I was, about, my car was filled up with all my belongings and boxes and my partner at the time. And as I was backing out of the driveway, she was beating the vehicle saying that it was her vehicle. Um, it's in her name, even though it was my money that paid for the vehicle. All right. Now, <clears throat> we've heard from uh, McMillan earlier in this case uh, that said that he used to use cocaine with the defendant. And I, I look at her uh, as she is today. Is this how your mom looked in 2002? No. Okay. What were her physical capabilities in 2002? She uh, was fully capable of um, running a full-time business. Uh, she didn't have any immobility issues. Um, while she was 
like chronically using cocaine and drinking heavily, she didn't start having immobility issues or like history of strokes or anything like that until my high school years. Okay. And so basically back in 2002, she was physically capable of basically doing everything that you or I could be doing today. Yes. Normal daily activities. Yes. All right. Now you indicated that your, your grandma died in 2015. Do you recall that date? My grandmother on my paternal side. Yes. Oh, your paternal side? Yes. Okay. My Would abuela. that be the same one that you called your abuela? My abuela. Okay. The same one that we saw in the exhibit that I showed the jury earlier? Yes. All right. Once your grandma died, did you go to the funeral? I did. I, um, again, took a leap of faith. I, at this time, was on my own living my early adulthood in the military and school full time. And I wanted to have the opportunity to face my dad and kind of, you know, let him hear it, like everything that he walked away from. All right, let me ask you this. Aww. At this point in your life, did you fully believe that your dad was still alive? N no. Did I mean, you, fully believe, yes, yes. You, you thought he was alive and he abandoned you many years ago? Yes, like I was rehearsing a whole speech for him. Aww. Okay, and so you went to Dominican. Uh, why would you assume that he would have been there? Um, I know he was really close with his mom. Uh, his, his family, he talked to all the time. I couldn't picture why he wouldn't show up to his own mother's funeral. Okay, so you went there, um, you flew there, and you had this whole speech prepared of how you were going to confront your father for leaving you in 2002. Yes. All right. Was your father there? No. And did you come to find out that none of your family had even heard from him since 2002? Yes, but they didn't go any further than that. They were just glad that I was reconnecting with the family. Okay. And so when you went back after the funeral back to Texas in your life, um, at that point, where were you living? Where was I living? Yes. I was um, living in San Angelo still. Uh, I would commute to Houston, Texas for my drill weekends with the Army National Guard. And I remember we had like a gap in our drill schedule because we normally have it in February where there's a gap, no drill. So like March time frame, my, next, my very next drill weekend that I had after the DR trip, I remember taking the opportunity to basically confront my mother. Oh, um, let me cut you off right there. You were in the Army National Guard. Yes. How long have you been doing that? I um, did, served eight years. At that point? Not at that point, but um, in 2014, I was actively in. Okay. And so this stands out to you because this is actually a drill weekend? Yes, I was in uh, uniform. And uh, how far did you have to drive to confront your mother? It was three and a half hours. Oh, sorry. Uh, San Angelo to Houston, seven hours. And uh, were you confronting your mother because of what you learned uh, about your father in the Dominican Republic? Yes. Okay. What, uh, what happened when you got there? I remember being very direct with her, um, like, you know, showing up in her house, and she was kind of, like, surprised, and I just approached her with, Mom, I need you to sit down and tell me what happened to my father or you're going to lose me forever. Like, I've always been the apple of her eye, so I was hoping that she would take me seriously in that moment. Did she tell you what happened to him? She immediately went into tears, and she began to tell me her version of the story. Okay, and this is something that you don't know personally. This is just something that she told you. Yes. Okay. What did she tell you about what happened to your father? Her words were that they had been arguing down in the basement and she was trying to get away and as she went to go walk up the stairs, um, like facing the stairs, going up the stairs, there's metal bars that you could kind of put your hands through if you wanted to and then there's a wall to the right. My mother's left-handed. Um, and I remember my father always sticking things on that side of the staircase, uh, like, you know, anything, Sammy Sosa stuff or like a bat or a tool or something. And so how my mom described it is that as she was going up the stairs, my dad began to pull her by her ankles to pull her back down and that she grabbed the nearest thing she could with her right hand, which happened to be a crowbar is what she said, and she swung it like that, the back of her head, um, to try to like get away from him and that her words, he started bleeding profusely from the head. All right, let me cut you off right there. And so, you indicated head. that your dad was a baseball fan. Yes. Okay. And uh, he had uh, baseball memorabilia. Would that have been stuff that he might have had in the basement in his area? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, but she didn't indicate that. She said she grabbed a crowbar. She said crowbar. And those were her words? Yes. Okay. And hit the victim, in this case, your dad in the head, uh, and he was bleeding profusely. Her words. Did she say where he went or if he fell down, anything like that? Did you ask her that? No, I didn't um, get too much in the detail. I was just processing what she was saying. I do remember, like, asking her right away, and what did you do? Did you call the police? Did you call the ambulance? Like, I'm sure he had a chance. There was a history of domestic violence. Like, what did you do? And she said that she couldn't do anything um, before she knew it. Deneen and her friends were heading downstairs to finish him off. Okay. And uh, you stated, and she used the words, Deneen and her friends. Yes. Plural friends. Yes. Okay, not Deneen and her friend. No. All right. And uh, so she said that before she could do anything, Deneen came down on her own. Did she tell you that she yelled up? Did she tell you that she, anything or any detail of what happened? No. Okay. Did you ask her? Um, no. Are you just listening at this point? Yes. Okay. And um, at that point, she told you, Deneen, uh, finished them up. Did she mention anything about uh, why she didn't call for help afterwards? She just said that before she could do anything, Deneen and her friends were coming down the stairs to okay. finish them off. Now, let me ask you this. Do you recall a time in your life, in your interactions between the defendant and Deneen, that Deneen would do anything without Beverly's prompting? She would never. She always ran things by my mom or knew that she would be in big trouble if she did anything against my mom. My mom was always in full control over the things that directly affected her. So does that story make any sense to you? Now that I think about it, no. Okay. And, but still your mom told you that she hit your father in the head with this crowbar. Yes. But then she blames everything else on Deneen and their friends. Yes. Would that be safe to say? Now, would it, uh, you indicated that this would have been about March 2015 that she told you the story? Yes. And you would agree that it wasn't until October of 2016 that Malpe and Detective Donker didn't show up at your house? They showed up the following year, October 3rd, 2016. Okay. So you're stating on this info from March until the next year, October. Would that be safe to say? I was. Okay. And uh, at, at this point, why didn't you tell anybody? I had a conflicted relationship. I leaned on denial. Um, my mother, she was the only parent I had, the only family, the only consistent family. Um, I've always just wanted family. Aww. And would you agree it also uh, took the detectives a little bit during the interview to try to get this out of you as well. Yes, it was towards the end of the interview that I actually worked up the courage um, to share it with them. Okay. You know, is this something that's incredibly hard for you today? I'm sorry? Is this something that's incredibly hard for you today? Yes. And is this something that uh, even now to talk about this in front of the jury with your mom in the room is still painful. Very. Okay. But that, does that change the fact that she told you this? No. Okay. And so she admitted to you that she knew what happened to your dad this entire time. Would it be safe to say? Yes. Uh, yet she still maintained that same story to you that your dad took off to Canada your entire life and led you to believe that. She told me the same story over and over again. <clears throat> Now, at some point during this interview, you were met, uh, you were shown the house, and then you were also shown a few diagrams from Detective Malpe. Do you recall those? This one, I'll start off with exhibit number 24. Do you recognize this? Yes, I do. Is this a diagram that you went over with Malpe at the time of your interview? Yes. Okay. Did you help him kind of draw this and get the layout of things when you met with him? Yes, and in the diagram it says living room, but that's where my mom um, stayed at. That was her master suite. Okay, and the trunk uh, that you testified to, do you recall seeing that trunk in that living room or in her bedroom every now and then? Yes. Okay, so that was something that 
your mom had, not Deneen or not anybody else? No, it was her property. All right. And I see that there's two bedrooms on here as well. Which one was yours at the time? The one next to the basement stairs Okay. by and the bathroom. Did Tasha have her own room? She did. It was by the rear door. And I see here on this sunroom uh, that's on the diagram that's up here. Yes. Would this be the same sunroom that Deneen would stay in when she was there? Yes. Okay. And then I also believe that you indicated that Chris would also stay in there sometimes, even without Deneen present. Yes, it was the spare room. Okay. And that would be the or... that would be the days that he was hanging out with Beverly, um, even when Deneen wasn't there. Yes. All right. And I'm showing you as marked as People's Exhibit Number Four. Do you recall this? Yes, that's the layout of the basement. Okay. And I, I see here on this diagram it says concrete patch there. Yes. Um, would this have been there in 2002? Do you recall ever seeing a concrete patch there in 2002? No. Okay, so that's something that you don't know about. Yes. All right. Where would be the area, and I, I believe it says it on here, uh, would Malby have gotten this information from you where it says area where victim used to sit? I remember, um, like I said, my daily routine was to go greet my father, I'd come down the stairs immediately to the right. He'd be sitting there where he kept his Bible and um, any writing material, things like that. The chair was there. Do you come home from school? This is your daily routine. You go downstairs, give him a hug, say I'm home. Yes. Talk to him for a little bit. Yes. And then after that, you would go do softball or whatever he had signed you up to do. Yes. All right. And this is stuff that you went over with Detective Maltby and Detective Donker in 2016. Yes. All right. Now, when you confronted your mom with this, uh, you indicated you had a little brother, Gaetano. Was he at the residence at that time? At the Horatio home? Uh, no, at the, uh, when you confronted your mom in Texas and when you went there after your drill weekend. Most likely, unless he was, um, no, it was weekend, yeah, most likely. Okay. She always kept him close. All right, and that was when your mom was actually living in Texas. Uh, did there come a point where she left Texas and moved somewhere else? Yes, um, after I reconnected with my family, <laughs> My paternal grandmother passed away in January, and then my maternal grandmother, her, her mother, passed away that April. Um, and so, yes, that same October of 2015, I remember her saying, uh, she, she called me and she said that whoever wants anything from my house, y'all need to come get it before Thursday because I'm selling the house. Okay. And this is the house that she lived in? Yes. Did she tell you why she was selling the house? She said that Deneen, my half-sister, was going to, um, wasn't going to let her live in peace, that she was threatening to turn her into the feds because she assumed my, my mother had okay. gotten life insurance for our grandmother. Okay. So Deneen, and this is something that uh, your mom told you, Deneen isn't going to let me live in peace. She's threatening to turn me into the feds. As blackmail, yes. And this was in October of 2015. Yes. And this house that she lived in, how do you know so much about it? I lived in that home with her, my maternal grandmother, and my little brother. Um, Part-time, I would say, because I was also staying with my maternal aunt during weekdays for school. But that was the last family home we had, All right. was so, in Pasadena. So she told you, Deneen's threatening to go to the feds. She gave you until Thursday to come get any stuff out of it. What happened to everything that was left? As I understood it, she sold the house well under market for $65,000 cash and that the buyer was going to empty out everything on their own with their own you know, container to dispose of her, the rest of her belongings that she didn't take. Um, and she, was, she took off with my little brother and went to go live full time in Pakistan. And that's where she lived until uh, sometime later in life? Yes. Now, during this interview with Chris Mc or with uh, Detective Donker and Detective Malby, I believe you were the one that brought up the uh, fact that there was somebody there named Chris. Yes. That would hang around to the house at the time. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And did they seem surprised that you brought up that name? Or I, did you, I did wasn't you attempt to try to figure out who this person was uh, with them? Yes. So. Um, they asked me who Chris was. I started to describe Chris as I remember him. Um, you know, Caucasian, sandy, bowl haircut, glasses, his facial hair. I tried to describe. I could remember him and his face clearly. Like, 
as a kid and as an early, right. you know, adult. Do you remember the sunglasses that he used to wear? Even that had then? transition sunglasses. Um, okay. That he wore glasses. And at some point, did you actually manage to get a photo uh, that you had found of Chris? Yes. All right. Who was that photo of? Of my half sister Tasha, and Chris. All right. And I'm showing you what's people's exhibit number one. Do you recognize this photo? Yes. Okay. Is this the photo that you actually provided, uh, Detective Malky? of this Chris person that was around at the time? After the interview, I did. Okay, so you actually tried to find this photo and then you turned this over after you had talked to your detective at the interview? Yes, it was on my mind to figure out if we had, because my mom had pictures of everything. I'm like, there has to be a picture of this guy. I remember what he looks like, and my half-sister Tasha did some digging and she presented that to me. All right. And talking about your half-sister Tasha, once again, that is not somebody, uh, you don't have the same father. No. So Beverly is her mother, uh, but Roberto is not her father. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Where is Tasha currently living right now? She lives in Houston, Texas. All right. Does she want anything to do with this case? Not at all. Okay. Let's get this. Is the last time you saw Chris McMillan in Jamaica? Yes. Right. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Tutwell. Mr. Finley. Thank you, Judge. May I walk about the well, Judge? Pardon me? May I walk about the Absolutely. Well? Thank you. Good afternoon, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is John Finley. I'm going to be one of the board defenders. Oh, today. he um, would be better okay be with nice. you if I called you Cicely as well? Sure. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you, okay? Can you speak um, up, please? Sure. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions for you. <clears throat> You had testified previously in the Denise Deschamps case in 2019, correct? Correct. Um, and during that time, um, you had testified there that you had spoken with Detectives uh, Mulpey as well as um, Detective Docker as well. Yes. Okay. Um, and when you had that lengthy discussion, do you know roughly around how long that discussion was with them? Several hours. And around that time, you had indicated to them that you were you had memories of being in the van. Yes. Okay. You remember a large flame, large explosion. I remember being woken up by an explosion in a woody area, in the back of a van. Okay. Um, you had indicated as well that the the driver of the vehicle was your mother Beverly, correct? Yes. Okay. Her voice was coming from the front of the van, so I assumed she was the driver. Um, and you also indicated that when you had woken up, you had seen your sister, Deneen, running toward the car, correct? Yes. Okay. And you also indicated that you did not see uh, Chris McMillan in the vehicle at all, correct? No, I had enough time to sit up, look where the sound was coming from, and then I was told to lay back down and go to sleep by my mother. that for her. Gosh, what a hard, what a hard, hard situation. <sighs> All right, um, let's see what else we got. That was everything from day one. Day two, there's only one video that's available. All right, let's see. So day two's updates. It says Gordon DeVries, 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 Gordon. The owner of a property located an hour and a half from the defendant's home testified that he discovered a body in the trunk in his blueberry field. Um, the body is burned beyond recognition and the trees and grass surrounding the trunk remain scorched more than 20 years later. Uh, so they have his. Uh, we can...
We can watch his. Sorry, I'm distracted. It's so pretty outside. I'm looking outside. Um, okay, so uh, Detective Robert Dunker, who responded to the scene, found a rope around the victim's neck and a hammer in the debris. Um, which was later linked to the bludgeoning death. Spent the next 13 years. Let's see how long the... Hold on. First, look how, look how pretty it is outside. It's so pretty outside. Okay. Sorry. Focus, Brandy. This one's short. Let's see. And in May 2002, on one of your pieces of property that you owned, did you happen to come upon a dead body? I did. Which piece of property was it that you came upon that dead body at? 152nd. Avenue and Wenin Street in Grand Haven Township. And that's in Ottawa County? Yes. Do you remember the day that you came upon that day, that dead body? Not the date, but the day I do. All right. Now, if I were to tell you that May 8th, 2002 was the actual date that you came upon the body, would you have any reason to disagree with that? No, that'd be about right. So let's go back to May 7th. 2002, the day before. And on May 7th, 2002, tell the jury how it is you would get to your property and what your property would look like. We, we have a 60 acre piece and to get into the property, it's a two track road through 75 yards of woods and uh, there's a gate there, and uh, that's how we enter it. I'm gonna show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 27. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that that we're looking at? That's the road going into the property. So it's a dirt road that sits in front of your property? Yes. What road is that that the dirt road is? Winnin Street. That's, that's Winnin Street? Now, how would you come into that property? Well, we'll go off Wyndham Street and go through that two track. Now, you mentioned that there was a gate. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 28. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that that we're looking at? Pardon? What is that that we're looking at? We're looking at the same two track with the gate open. With the gate open. Now, Can you see over here, Gordon? Yes. Is this the gate that we're talking about? Correct. And over here in this area, is there a pole? Yes, there's a post that the gate attaches to. 
And so this gate swings across your two track? Yes. I'm going to actually show you what's been admitted previously, People's Exhibit 13. Do you recognize that? That is the gate. That's a close-up of the gate? Yes. The same item that we're talking about in that picture there. That thing, and what's on the screen now is the close-up of the gate? Yes. And on May 7th, would that a gate have been closed? Yes. Stretches across the property, and how do you attach it? With a chain. With a chain, so it looks like it's locked? Yes. On May 7th, do you go into your property? Yes. What do you do? We were looking for turkeys. Who's we? My father and I. And what happens when you go into your property? You said you have like 75 yards of forest area? Is yeah. That, and then inside there, what, what do you grow inside? And we have a blueberry farm inside the woods. And so are you able to drive in? Yes. And did yes. you do that? Yes. Did you notice anything on that day? No turkeys. No turkeys. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair to say you were probably left at that point? Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to bring you to the next day, May 8th, 2002. Once again, would you have gone to your property, your blueberry farm? Yes. Same blueberry farm that you've just talked about that you own? Yes. And on May 8th, 2002, was the gate closed? Yes. And would you have had to go up that road once again and open the gate to get into your property? Yes. Now, on May 8th, 2002, was anything different about the way that you would have gone up the road and into the property? Well, the only thing different I noticed the, uh, the pine which was there was very scorched. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 29. Do you recognize that to be your property? Yes. Is that what you is that what you would have observed on that day yes. as you were driving in? Was that there the day before? No. So what do you do? Well, I, I, when I stopped and looked at the tree, then I looked down and I observed the body. So you drive into your property as you're driving up this two track. You stop. Where exactly did you stop, do you think? Right across from the scorch. Right across from the scorch. And you're telling the jury at that point you see a body? Yes. Now, these are pictures you've previously seen. I'm going to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 30. Do you recognize that? Yes, that, uh, that's the body. Is that what you would have observed on May 8th, 2002? Yes. I'll show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 31 as well. Did you see that as well? Yes. So you see those two pictures, Gordon, and what do you do? First of all, I couldn't believe what I saw, so I just drove by it, drove around the farm, and came back thinking maybe it'd be gone, but it wasn't. I'll show you the last photo I have for you is Exhibit 32. So you would have driven around your farm and turned around. Coming back out that two track? Yes. So now that sorts area would be on your left hand side, is that Correct. right? Yep. Is it gone? No, the, the grass area is, but the tree is still scorched. We're talking today. That, yes, that, we're talking today. Your trees are still scorched in 2024. Yes. You can still see where this happened. Yes. But back on 2002, when you drive through your farm, you're saying, I can't believe what I saw. And as you're driving back out that two track, is what you had seen driving in still there as you're driving out? Yes. So what do you do? Well, I had forgotten my cell phone that day, so I went to the neighbors and got him and we used we we observed the body and we called 911 and uh, it went from there fair to say that uh that would be traumatic when you brought your neighbor back why were you bringing your neighbor back 
Because he had a cell phone. He had a cell phone. Were you also wanting him to make sure that somehow? Yeah, I, I, it isn't something you do every day. Not something you see every day. Or right. And so you and the neighbor come back. You said you got out of your truck? Yes. Did you look at the body? Yes. And at that point you called 911? Yes. Fair to say that police showed up after that? Yes. A lot of police? Yes. And is it fair to say that you would have given a statement as to what you had observed on May 8th, 2002? Yes. Same statement pretty much that you're giving us today? Correct. Your Honor, uh, I believe these items have also been stipulated to as well, these exhibits. And so with the admission of these exhibits, uh, I have no further questions. Yes, exhibits 29, 30, 31, and 32 have been admitted and published. Mr. Havis, any cross-examination? Oh, sorry, Mr. Finley. Yes, Judge Briefly, thank you. Good morning, Mr. DeVries. Good morning. My name is John, I'll be a public defender today. Um, would it be okay if I addressed you as uh, Gordon as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, this two track is off of Winnens Road, correct? Correct. How do you get to Winnens Road? Uh, from US 31. Okay, so it's like right off of a highway? Yeah, it's a half a mile off the highway. Okay, all right. Um, so, approximately how long is that two track road, would you estimate? Mm, probably 100 yards at the most. So, okay, okay. Um, and then between Winnens and that gate in particular, how far would you say? Uh, probably 50, 60 feet. Okay. All right. And then initially when you drove onto that two track, you didn't see anything initially, correct? I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. When you initially came onto the two track, you didn't see anything initially. You did. Which day? On, on the day that you, um, reported the body being found. No. Okay. So you had to go onto the two track. Yes. And then you saw the scorched earth. Yes. And then you initially saw it and you testified that you thought it would go away. Well, I didn't believe really what I saw. It, it, uh, I was hoping it would go away. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. And that's part of the reason why you went and grabbed the neighbor, correct? I went to the neighbors because I didn't have a cell phone after I realized that this was there. Okay. Okay. So, when you saw the gate, was actually let me let me rephrase. From what you remember of the gate, you saw that you had left the chain on it. From the last you recollect, right? Yeah, the chain is on the gate. Okay. So when you came in on the eighth, was the chain still on the gate? Yes. Okay. Did it look like anyone had touched or anything? Well, we didn't lock it, so it's just it's just there. No, I didn't I didn't notice anything different. Okay, okay. So it was in the same condition yeah. of when you left it previously. Yeah. Okay. Right. Did you notice any tracks, like any foot um, like like footprints or any tracks at all from a vehicle or something? No. Yeah. No? Okay. Did you notice any garbage or any refuse, anything like that as well? Nothing. <sighs> it, that's where it cuts off. That's all they gave us. Um, kind of crazy. Uh, so... That's all we have for the clips. Um, that's not what I wanted to hit. All right, let's see what other updates they gave. So we heard that and then they had the um, detective who talks about some of the stuff that we read that, the um, uh, 
how it took 13 years to identify him, um, following up on countless tips and seeking the help of area dentists to help look for a match with the dental records, um, became a cold case known as the Jack in the Box murder. It's the title of a documentary produced in an effort to learn the victim's identity. The break in the case comes from April of 2015 when Deneen, the daughter who was involved, um, contacts Donker and tells him the victim could be her stepfather and points the finger at her mother. Donker collaborates with Eaton County Detective and they travel to Houston where they interview Deneen, her cousin, and Cicely, the one that we heard from. Uh, the interviews eventually help them uncover evidence in the basement of the home where the defendant, victim, and their family lived. And I said Charlotte, but I guess it's Char Charlotte. That's how they say it. Um, uh, let's see. The interview of Cicely generates their mo most important lead in the investigation, identifying Chris McMillan as a witness and suspect. Uh, let's see. They offer... Uh, Deneen and Chris offer details about the murder. Detectives return to the house where they test for blood spatter and DNA. Michigan State Crime Lab aid in the processing of the Horatio Street home and will testify about the forensic results when they testify Wednesday. So then we jump to Wednesday. So yesterday, there's no um, videos that are given for yesterday. Um, oh. It just says, um, Beverly McCallum broke her silence today responding to questions from the judge. I'll do this. Um, look how pretty it is. I need to be outside. Um, okay, so she, uh, Broke her silence today responding to questions from the judge about her right to testify. Her lawyers informed the court that they would discuss the decision with her on Thursday and inform the judge Friday when court is back in session. Um, a DNA... So they're supposed to talk to her today about it. Um, a DNA expert uh, testified that items removed from the crime scene and tested for DNA did not match the DNA of Beverly or her co-defendants. Joni Johnson suggested... <laughs> You know what that reminds me of? Joni Johnson. Did y'all ever hear that Tim McGraw song? Take Jimmy Johnson. Take Tommy Thompson. Take my best friend, Bo. It's Jimmy Johnson. This is Joni Johnson. And Joni Johnson suggested that the lack of DNA could have meant the suspects wore gloves. Among the items that she was given to test was a box of gloves. DNA on the box was compared to the three suspects in this case, and they were ruled out as contributors. She also compared their DNA to DNA on the rope around the victim's neck, a cushion from the crime scene, and a hair on the cushion, and concluded no match. Johnson went to the defendant's house in the summer of 2015 to test for the presence of blood. On their first trip, they focused on the first floor which did not yield any results. On their second trip, they sprayed the basement with luminol, a presumptive test for blood and another chemical test that confirmed the presence of blood in the area where McMillan says the victim was fatally bludgeoned. A portion of the concrete with a blood stain could not be examined at the Michigan State Crime Lab and was sent to an independent lab. An analyst from Cybergenetics was able to determine from the sample that one of the contributors was victim Robert Carabio. <sighs> so, that was yesterday. So today, we don't have anything yet. Um, that's all we got for now. Don't take the girl. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. YouTube don't work out. I'm going to be a country singer. All right. That's all we got today. I am going to, it is so pretty outside and I want to go for a walk and get some sunshine before I have to come back in here and get back to work. 
maybe I can find like an auto-tune program. And so that way when I sing to y'all, it won't be quite so miserable for all of you listening. Not a singer, not a singer. I am physically capable of the act of singing. It just don't sound good, but that's okay. That's okay. Makes you, makes you cry. It makes me cry when Tim McGraw sings it. It makes other people cry when I sing it. But it's okay. It's all right. Um, okay, so tomorrow um, I have a, I'm recording, um, I'm recording on Cup of Justice in the morning, so I won't be available to start earlier. So we are going to do, tomorrow will probably be a short stream because we're not gonna start a new trial, obviously, because Monday starts Chad Daybell. The storm is coming. Um, so tomorrow we're gonna do, if there's any more updates on this, we can look at the updates for Timothy Verrill and some stuff like that. So tomorrow will be a little bit short, uh, especially because starting next week, like, I thought my schedule was crazy now, but it's going to be even crazier next week. Um, so I will probably do a short stream tomorrow so that I can try to at least rest a little bit. Um, and then next week, of course, we have Chad Daybell. So here's, here's the plan. Uh, jury selection starts on Monday. How long did Lori's jury selection take? I don't remember. How long was Lori Vallow jury selection? Um, how long did, do we know? Do we remember? Do we? I don't know. I, I can't. It was three days. God, I was thinking it was longer than that. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, so the jury selection will, will not be like, this is not going to be one of those that's like, you know, they have jury selection starting in the morning and bam, we got openings in the afternoon. I mean, it could be. Look, I've been wrong before. Have I though? Just joking. Um, so it could, it could be. But the chances of that happening are slim to none because it is a death penalty case as well. So uh, jury selection will probably last for a while. But my plan is um, for Monday, we are going to do a... Um, I, I put it on Twitter. said, you know, polish off your portals and grab your devil tacos because... We're going to do a crash course in everything you missed. If you did not watch Lori Vallow with us the first time, um, it was my very first trial streaming. And we had to do it at night because they didn't release the audio until the end of the day. And I had to create graphics for everything because there was no video. It was only audio. And it... Of all the trials that I could have picked for my very first one to ever stream, I probably picked what would have been the hardest for all of those reasons, but love a challenge, right? So if you didn't watch that one with us or you didn't watch it or it's just been a while or, you know, whatever, then we're going to do, um, I'm going to dust off all my old charts and graphs and all the stuff um, that we did for Lori Vallow and we'll do kind of like a crash course on some of that stuff. So, um... Oh, God. The storm is coming. Um, I am... I am... ready for it. I am ready for it. That was a brutal first one. Because you know what's funny? I'm having to follow, like, the, um, the people who are in court all day tweeting about what's happening. I'm having to follow who's on the stand so that I can then find them create graphics, and that way everybody has something to look at. You can kind of picture everything, and it was so much work. Um, it was so much work. <laughs> uh, you know what's funny? The very first stream that I did, I sat 
over there on my, I have like this little bitty, it's, I say it's a desk. It's really like a, more like a vanity. And I sat right there on my little Chromebook with Lucy in my lap, not knowing what the heck I was doing. And I'm sitting there holding Lucy the whole time because I was like terrified that there's people staring at me and we're listening to the trial together. But now you can see me and I can't see you, but you can see me. And that was really freaky. Um, my first, my first ever live stream was bless it, but that's okay. Look how far we've come. Still messing stuff up, just different stuff now. So it's all right. Um, <laughs> can I explain what the storm is coming means? Yeah. So, uh, so Chad's a perv. Um, here. Let me just, let me just show you. God, I got so many windows open. <sighs> so many windows. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bill's over there throwing things. I hear him. I just be dropping stuff. All right. So... If you go to More Fun and then History 101, it has like some of the history from some of our um, <laughs> some of our stuff. So I have like Letitia right here, um, and then you go down to Lori Valadebel. So we have uh, a. <laughs> um, uh, so it said among the nauseating romance BS that Chad wrote to Lori was as follows: quote. Grab me by the storm and I'll follow you to the ends of the earth, end quote. Directly following that, the detective tells us that the storm is the nickname that they gave his... I mean, well, you can see where the storm is placed. Um, so, yeah, uh... The storm is coming. And you know what? I live on the beach and I love me a good beach storm. And it took me a good six to eight months before I was able to actually enjoy them again. I'd be like, don't call it a storm. Um, and then the devil taco, of course. So in another WTF moment, we hear testimony from Ian Pulowski in the trial of Lori Vallow explaining how she told him that she took Satan, folded him like a taco, and sent him to Antarctica where he is now trapped in a box. As of this writing, there are currently no devil tacos remaining in Arizona or Idaho. And then, of course, we have loin fire. Blech. Um, we had to listen to what is basically a dollar store knockoff Harlequin romance book. Chad Daybell describes in grotesque detail his desire and loin fire for Lori Vallow. Uh, he also compares himself to Harry Potter because he's stuck having to spend time with his family. Poor guy. Ugh. And then, of course, we have the, um, the wedding photos. Uh, we had to add our special guest who came on to, to see us. Ugh. Gross. Gross, gross. You know, they say there's somebody for everybody in the world. Those two deserve each other. And then the whole portal thing, like, they believed that they could... Port we'll go over all of this next week on Monday. But um, they believed that they could just portal on over to each other. Uh, I think Lori's portal was in her closet. If I remember right, and his was in his bed, I think. So, but we did get the trial daddy calendar from it. We did get that. That part, um, and the trial mamas, um, that part was the more fun part. Like, we did get, we did get the hot cops and trial daddies. Um, oh, detective daddy. I hope he comes back. We'll actually be able to see him this time. 
Um, <laughs> and of course, we got on our trial diaries, we have Matthew Harris Law and Weather Watch. Um, you know, when, when Mark was on the show, I don't think I told him that he was a trial daddy, did I? It's good. And then, okay, so we had Detective Daddy, and then we had uh, Sergeant Daddy, a.k.a. the Hump Day Honey. He had one of those voices that was like butter. I haven't looked at these in a while. I remember having to make these, like... Travis... Anyway, we got a lot on here. Oh, I remember him. He was a canine handler, too. Boom. So, we had a bunch of them on there. Um, fun times. Fun times. <sighs> Watching justice prevail. Watching justice prevail. Um, I told um, Kay Woodcock last night, I was like... You know, we're, we're ready for this next chapter. We're rooting for you. You've got our support. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're ready. I love, love, love her and Larry. Love them so much. Love them so much. So, they're incredible. So, this is um, the next chapter in them getting justice and I am here for it I am here for it so um, so that's all we got for today I will see you tomorrow like I said we will do a short stream tomorrow just to do the updates and whatnot and then Monday um, what time did I say is tomorrow I've already set it up so whenever you see it um, but I've uh, I've got it set up for tomorrow I think I'm supposed to be doing Cup of Justice till like 10 or 10.30, so I'll probably set it up for 11. I don't know. It's on there. But then I've also got the one set up for Monday, so we can do all that. So um, that is the plan. And then we'll just kind of play it by ear with, um, with jury selection, how long it takes to see when they actually start streaming it. Uh, the video, I will tell you, the... Video footage is not, like, this is going to be, like, through the court. So, it's not going to be good, like, it, I mean, look, beggars can't be choosers. We didn't even have video at all during Lori Vallow. So, I'm glad that we're at least getting video. But those um, hearings that we've been watching where we're just watching from, like, the court feed, the ones that we did for Chad Daybell and all that, that's all we're getting. So... Um, it's not, it's not going to be, um, like, you know, court TV cameramen in there, you know, doing their thing. It's, it's, we get what we get and we don't pitch fit. So, but at least we get, actually get video on this one. But I've also still got all of my old graphics and everything from Lori Vallow. So anytime that we can't really see who it is, I can pull up, you know, that stuff too, to kind of, um kind of do it but it'll be good but at least we get video this time at least we get video this time makes it a lot easier all right y'all i appreciate you all thank you so much happy friday eve go out into the world and be happy it is friday eve y'all we have almost made it through the week almost made it through the week i feel like there's something else that's going on that i was supposed to announce or talk about Oh, tomorrow we'll do the drawing, too. For If you haven't listened to Conspiracy in Canton or to 13 Tour Podcast, any of them, really, doesn't have to be Conspiracy in Canton. we got the trial recap episodes, too, the jury duty re um, episodes. I haven't been doing those since I've been doing Conspiracy in Canton, though. Can't fit at all. Um, but if you have not listened to it, we're doing the contest. If you listen, just take a screenshot where you listened, and you can email it to me, and I'll enter you in for the contest, and we will draw a winner tomorrow sound good mods i love you so much y'all are amazing i would be lost without you i appreciate you members 
stalkers, fans, haters, anybody watching, anybody watching. I appreciate y'all too. Um, y'all are the best. 13 jurors, I would not be here without you. I appreciate you all so much. I will see y'all tomorrow on Friday. We're almost there. I gotta go. I can't, I can't stick around here forever. It was wonderful. Everybody behaved. Everybody's always so nice to me. Just love your channel. And... Goodbye, good people. Now, how the heck do I get out of here?